And looking at the speeches that we're going to, to hear during this conference, I really think that we will get a lot of inspiration, lots of new knowledge, and lots of new contacts, making even more exhibitions and other educational programs and so on possible in the future. So thank you. But now, it's a great honor, and uh, I'm very thankful uh, for this invitation acceptance from the Deputy Secretary General for Maritime and the Minister of Economic Affairs and Communication, Mr. Kaupo Lanerand. And I would say maybe some words about <laughs> that. Mr. Lanerand is a maritime expert with a long-term man long management and experience both in private sector and also in the public. Uh, Mr. Lanerand is uh, very particularly interested in innovation and cooperation. Uh, especially when it comes to the overcoming the challenges and deliver, delivering the strategies to achieve great efficiency, sustainability uh, and resilience in the maritime sector. Welcome, Pakofo, and the floor is yours. So, it is my honour to open this conference and uh, maritime heritage is definitely a powerful word, isn't it? It's, uh, when it comes to your mind, maritime heritage is a strong, strong uh, word to use. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, when, when I think about maritime uh, heritage uh, as a term, then it's uh, very wide. It, you can, uh, uh, it's, it can be technical, uh, it can be uh, just spoken through generations, uh, all the knowledge and uh, culture behind it. So, so for me, it's very powerful word to use. And uh, let's say it's it was about uh, survival before uh, for islanders and coastal uh, people living at the coast. Uh, it was all about survival. Uh, the uh, the sea what surrounded them, but at the moment actually it's, it's, uh, it's the same thing for us, it's a little bit in, built up differently. Uh, our export uh, from Estonia is 60% from uh, through the ports, so we are still very reliant on, uh, on, the, on the sea. Uh, if uh, we look at uh, what we are dealing in the, in the ministry, then at the moment actually yeah, we are in the final stage of uh, delivering new maritime strategy in Estonia. It's called uh, Maritime uh, Policy White Book. White books are very uh, popular words these days. And, and it shows that uh, Estonian, uh, uh, Estonian nation and Estonian, uh, uh, Estonia's uh, coastal state, Estonia's maritime states, we have uh, uh, key priorities. The key priorities are competitive and sustainable maritime economy. This is definitely one thing to help us uh, uh, to achieve greater income and uh, greater uh, competitive advantage over uh, other states. Uh, there is a priority maritime education and R&D. Maritime education is definitely for us key because if there is no competent uh, workers uh, or new uh, competencies in the future uh, for our maritime economy, then there is nothing to do. Uh, we cannot import everything. Uh, so, so definitely, that's the one of the key challenges uh, for us. What we need to solve together with universities, together with sector, together with. Uh, ministries and also uh, that's good uh, uh, that I can show you in this conference uh, the, <coughs> the maritime heritage is, is also key priority areas because uh, maritime heritage for us uh, surrounds us everywhere and uh, and uh, you we, we see that we need to strengthen this area we need to take action to to make uh, maritime heritage uh, to keep the maritime heritage as uh, one of the pillars in the in the maritime sector and maritime economy <coughs> and also together with uh, coastal tourism that in Estonia maybe it's it's definitely because of the cold weather but uh, 
uh, when we think about blue economy, then uh, actually the, the, in the European Union, the coastal tourism is uh, one, of, one of the biggest uh, areas in the blue economy. And uh, also all the employees, uh, uh, when you look at employees, then, then the coastal tourism, is, uh, coastal tourism in the European Union is also the biggest uh, uh, they have biggest percentage of employees in there, so so that's definitely the area what uh, we need to uh, we need to improve ourselves. Uh, but it's it's we we are improving every day. There there are more and more boats, uh, more and more boat owners uh, in uh, for in, in Estonia, and uh, and definitely uh, owning the boat uh, is it old. Uh, Wooden boat is it, is it is it sailing boat or or expensive uh, uh, expensive uh, motor boat which uses consumes uh, one million <laughs> one million uh, 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 let's say let's say what consumes uh, uh, one thousand cubic meters of uh, of uh, of fuel per, per day so so it can be different areas in the in this in this way so as Estonia uh, because we have uh, many nations here in visiting we see ourselves as uh, uh, digitally advanced society and we recognize the importance of blue economy so for us the e-governance and e-services are the key priority I understand that we had almost all uh, services online governmental services only ones who were out of it were to get married and to get divorced. So I understand that at the moment current is trying to make those also partially online. So, so we'll see how this will go. Uh, also, we are looking uh, to become a maritime cybersecurity hub and also uh, to, uh, to support the sector to become more greener and use more green technologies in, in, our, in our maritime economy. When we speak about uh, maritime cybersecurity, because this conference is about digitalization as well, so uh, we can uh, digitalize ourselves, but there is no use if uh, there is uh, no security. Usually we think about security as uh, security and safety at sea or underwater, but uh, in this case, when we are reusing more and more digitalized solutions, then uh, that's the part what we have to improve ourselves as well. So in Estonia, we have an Aiden Cyber Security Center, and uh, we tried to create in Taltec uh, the Maritime Cyber Security Hub for this region. So definitely, we have to look at, uh, at the aspects of technology aspects of communication, aspects of human elements. So uh, the human element is uh, quite uh, often uh, uh, the element uh, who gets, uh, who is behind uh, most of the attacks uh, on, on the cybersecurity. Uh, it can be physical, it can, it can be uh, opening the letter from your bank and, and uh, you have all received those. And they are definitely looking at the moment the partners from shipping companies, from <coughs> ports, from maritime training institutions. So when we speak about Baltic Sea, then definitely Baltic Sea is uh, uh, the best place for uh, underwater cultural heritage. So when you speak about this cultural heritage underwater, then it's uh, not, it's, is, it, is it in Estonian territorial waters, uh, inner sea, or is it uh, in economic exclusive zone? When we speak about that, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's heritage for all of us. So we don't know what, uh, what's the history behind the, the boat at the, at the bottom or, or, or the ship. So it's part of uh, all of us and, uh, and definitely 
it requires uh, a lot of international cooperation, but why it's uh, so wide audience in here that uh, to cooperate more and more to achieve uh, 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 better knowledge from each other, uh, learn from the best practices. So, so when you speak about digitalization, then definitely, uh, yeah, uh, we are improving in this area more and more uh, to get good look at uh, what's under under there. We don't need to bring the RICs up. We can investigate the RICs at the bottom, and uh, the possibilities are improving all the time. So we have really the technology is improving very fast, so we don't have to use only uh, divers. We can support everything with underwater robots, ROVs, sonars, Estonia and companies are uh, using more and more smart buoys which uh, can reduce the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, operating at the sea as well. And also we have to understand the importance of digital solutions. When we look at future of maritime, let's say for example as uh, Estonian sea area, then uh, operating there, is it operating for the aims uh, of uh, uh, cult cultural heritage, is it uh, operating uh, uh, by government, by police and border guard, is it operating by transport agency, <coughs> is it uh, our defense forces, is it uh, uh, private sector companies in there, uh, any sailing clubs. Uh, the future of maritime looks like this. So uh, you can see uh, there is a Taltec uh, mine ship vessel uh, uh, near Hiuma, uh, uh, which is uh, they are developing an autonomous vessel. So definitely the future of even Estonian State Fleet Agency will be that part of the fleet uh, are unmanned vessels with the uh, possibility to uh, see underwater, uh, patrol the area, give the maritime, uh, uh, to give the picture, of, uh, maritime picture to the coastal, to, to the coastal institutions. So it's, it's our future already. This model in there, the white one, it, it can, uh, it can operate 600 kilometers at sea with uh, full tanks. So, so uh, it definitely we need to continue to develop those. It can help uh, uh, people in this audience. It can help the government. It can help the uh, private sector to be more efficient. You don't need to send out always the, the ship uh, uh, and, and the persons on it to operate it, definitely. Uh, the future is for multifunctional vessels. Estonia's state is trying to improve the, the usage of vessels as well, that the percentage of uh, use of Estonian, let's say, government-owned vessels is very low. So we are trying to uh, achieve the greater efficiency in this area. And for this, definitely multifunctional vessels for the future are required. Is it? Uh, uh, Swedish colleagues should recognize it, it, it should be Elektra, also used to look underwater in, 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 uh, in Sweden. Uh, I think it was built in Estonia, so it's by our maritime industry. Uh, also, when you look at, let's say, for example, icebreakers, it doesn't have to be icebreaker. Uh, it, it can be icebreaker with uh, pollution control equipment, it can be icebreaker with headquarter for crisis, for defense use. It can have uh, helicopter landing areas uh, to evacuate, to make the medevac, uh, to, to refuel uh, our, our uh, helicopters. There can be a lot of different usage or surveillance. So it doesn't have to be icebreaker. The scientific vessel doesn't have to be scientific vessel. We are trying to, to build the vessel uh, let's hope, uh, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed uh, if uh, re we receive the funding, it's 95% sure that we can build a vessel for pollution control, for scientific research and uh, also for installing the buoys at sea, so you can be multifunctional. So uh, smart buoys as well, 
uh, definitely our future, uh, especially when we discuss what's going on, uh, what we saw, what happened uh, in uh, in Denmark with uh, with the uh, gas pipeline. So there are already very uh, highly advanced uh, smart buoys what uh, can be submerged. Uh, ice can come and go, but uh, we can see and measure everything uh, on the water. We can cover, we can uh, cover uh, huge areas when we keep the distance between the boys, and uh, and uh, and uh, we don't have to uh, patrol on those areas all the time at sea. Uh, there are smart buoys uh, which are used uh, in the in the. Uh, uh, on the, let's say in the, in the surface and uh, those buoys as well uh, for you can use them for uh, measuring uh, pollution in the water uh, measuring the uh, air uh, you can use them for surveillance uh, there are huge w wide of possibilities to, to use those buoys at sea so definitely our future also real time satellite monitoring where I'm quite sure that uh, uh, this audience is using uh, this possibility as well, uh, uh, and also an environmental friendly ferries. We, as coastal nation with many islands, uh, we see as uh, our aim to to build uh, new new ferries uh, to be uh, more green at sea, less uh, emissions, and uh, and. Uh, uh, to, to use ferries uh, in uh, wide possibilities uh, and yeah, so that's that's the, our future so but uh, one of the pillars of all of all of this picture what you can see in in the in the picture is uh, maritime heritage and maritime competencies uh, 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 our islands, uh, our people li living at the coast. So, so that's that's the bottom of it. Uh, so we have discussed also how to get more people studying in in Estonia Maritime Academy. But actually, when I was uh, learning in there, there are um, I think most of the group was from the islands because they have strong uh, uh, maritime cultural heritage and uh, living near the coast in Estonia so so definitely uh, that's the uh, that's that's the key uh, for cultural heritage for the new competent uh, competencies uh, to get uh, uh, young people uh, at sea i see that definitely we need to catch them already uh, not in the 12th grade but already before ninth grade uh, somewhere between uh, six, uh, sixth 6th grade and 8th grade to 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 uh, to get more Estonian, to get more, let's say, uh, maritime classes or sailing clubs, or, or or you need to catch the young uh, generation in early stages to 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 get them uh, love Estonia, Estonian uh, uh, maritime uh, culture even more and more. So yeah, definitely, it's the pillar, and uh, and I think uh, most greener uh, ship. What you can see is the sailing ship in here. So, so that's the that's the answer for European Union ambitions with Fit for 55. Uh, we actually have the technology to make everything greener, and the best ones of those sailing ships were quite fast. So, so one of uh, our futures as well. But yeah, uh, okay, exactly on time. So, uh, for a last verse from me is don't fear the sea, respect the sea, and then the sea smiles at you. It was said by Captain Kihnuyen. And I wish you fruitful discussions for the conference, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, our first speaker is a good colleague of mine, Brit Lehti. Uh, we both uh, started working in Maritime Museum at the same time, nine years ago. Uh, as uh, researchers, uh, and uh, in addition, Pete uh, is a doctoral student of uh, Tallinn University, and his main area of research is maritime material culture in urban, urban environment. Um, his presentation will introduce uh, the questions, problems, 
uh, and solutions concerning exhibiting the shipwreck. Something that is the most probably the uh, best known uh, object uh, of study in uh, underwater and maritime archaeology. Uh, and of course, in several cases uh, around the world, forms the centerpiece of uh, most popular and visited museums, also in our case. Uh, I would now give the floor to Preet. Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, in the next a few minutes, I would like to briefly discuss the, the question about the ship in the museum. And um, I am not going to tell you about the ships in the museum harbor. There is a distinction of term between the museum ship and the ship in the museum. And I will not touch the topic of museum ships. Um, I would use the best case we have at the moment, at least the biggest case we have at the moment, which is uh, the medieval vessel that is exhibited uh, right next to us in, in the Fat Margaret Cannon Tower. Uh, it was found in 2015, uh, marked by a red arrow, is the find spot uh, during construction works, as uh, such things tend to happen in recent years, uh, it's uh, called Peter's Wreck or Peter's Cog. Uh, Pet Peter or Peter uh, was the operator of the digging machine uh, who, uh, which uncovered the wreck. And uh, since uh, the excavator driver was smart enough to instantly notice that uh, there are ship details in the scoop and halted the works, then the name is more than suitable to celebrate this uh, uh, find. At first, it uh, seemed to be only loose pieces and a lot of them, uh, but uh, then it turned out that uh, a large part of uh, the vessel was preserved, uh, is preserved, uh, and um, it turned out to be a medieval cargo vessel with uh, numerous uh, very interesting archaeological finds aboard. After that decision, or after that discovery, a decision was made to transport the ship uh, into Maritime Museum. And uh, maybe contrary to usual practice, it was decided to be transported in one piece. So um, a support structure was built under and around the vessel uh, for lifting and transporting it. Here you can see the lifting operation, the, first, uh, the second one, because the first one failed, uh, since we are talking about the uh, uh, coastal area with uh, its uh, sand, uh, the, the, the big crane which was required for the lifting uh, just didn't have a strong enough base, so the first one um, didn't, went, didn't go as plan, planned, but um, the second attempt was uh, successful. The ship was uh, on a trailer uh, here you can very well see the very uh, tight, very good and sturdy support structure. I, I point that out uh, because, of, uh, because of the later uh, discussion. Uh, so under the cover of the night, as such operations tend to happen, uh, the ship uh, began its way to the Maritime Museum, actually to the seaplane harbor, and not here at, to the um, Fat Margaret Tower. Mm. A very significant picture, actually. Today, uh, this is a, a Stadtoil um, gas station, but uh, this is the area of uh, medieval 
harbor. So uh, I, I especially wanted and waited for that picture uh, because uh, for the, probably for the second time during 700 years, the ship was now back in Tallinn Harbor. Um, and then, of course, it was covered and waited at the seaplane harbor for a, a building to be created or erected around it. Uh, here you can see we needed some additional support because, as you might imagine, uh, the ship is actually not meant to be lifted and transported through the city, so additional supports uh, were needed. And uh, uh, are we, it doesn't actually matter if we are talking about uh, exhibition or not, uh, such finds need constant care. Uh, the first big decision uh, is the conserva conservation method, what to do with it. Uh, on the right you can see the, the ship of Masilin, which is currently housed at the seaplane harbor. Uh, it was uh, treated with um, peg, um, and, uh, and our, uh, this Peter's wreck was uh, controlled, uh, with, was conser conserved with controlled drying, but regardless of the conservation method, uh, constant care must be taken and, and the climate must be observed. And also uh, the cleaning uh, which took part after the ship arrived at the seaplane harbor uh, was essentially the continuation of excavation works. The methodology is the same, the tools are the same, uh, so, and here you can see, uh, it was really needed. We, we got uh, well over 100 new finds from that wreck. Uh, here you can see the measuring creed uh, there and, and conservator actually working uh, in, in the stern part of the ship. And here is another one. So, uh, time consuming, but of course very interesting um, process. Which was not uh, possible without uh, quite a lot of forced labor by students. So, uh, f Finnish uh, conservation students got really a lot of practice, as, as well, of course, as Estonian. So, we used them heavily and uh, without any regret. Um, of course, the, the one decision that we had to make is uh, how do we treat the ship? Uh, will we treat it as an archaeological find? Maybe this uh, co uh, question is a little bit peculiar, actually. So, um, but, but for me, it was essential. Uh, will we treat it as an archaeological find, or, or will we treat it as a ship? We decided to treat it as a live ship, which means that we replaced the nails, the tree nails, the, the wooden pegs, uh, in the same way as we would do on a floating vessel. Uh, also, um, uh, some smaller details were attached back uh, and uh, basically the same material that would be used uh, in, uh, in, in other wooden vessels uh, were, were used. So, uh, also we decided <coughs> to avoid any, or not any, we can't do that, uh, we decided to avoid uh, foreign materials as much as possible. Which, which means that as, le as little metal as possible and, and all such things. And of course, uh, the ship had to be scanned a couple of times uh, because we really wanted to see the original shape. We wanted to assess the deformations. And finally, and now we are uh, slowly getting into exhibition questions also, uh, we wanted to reconstruct the possible original shape. Uh, of course, we needed help, uh, and uh, we had uh, quite a lot of loose uh, details which were uh, drawn and digitized and modeled. Believe me, there is. Um, <laughs> uh, 
thank you. The, the, the wonders of modern technology can be used not only for modeling the ship. Um, so, yes, uh, from, from drawing, drawings which were made during the excavations, uh, 3D modeled details were um, created and they were attached virtually back to the ship. So this is the model all in almost complete form and here is, is the model finally. Um, yes, we wanted to understand the overall shape, but the model was also needed for various uh, purposes in, in the exhibition. And now, at first it was a crazy idea. Let's put the ship in the medieval tower. What can go wrong? Uh, it, uh, it turned out that it, it, it was a very good place for it. Uh, but there are, of course, some essential questions that need to be answered first. The museum or the building where the ship is housed, is, it, it must be safe for the ship. If it's safe for the visitors, that is a nice bonus. But if we want to uh, preserve a unique archaeological ship, then the safety of the exhibit is paramount. Also, the ship must be observable, preferably from all angles. And usually the first question that uh, museum visitors ask is how did the ship look like in the past? How, how big it was and, and how did it look like? So the original shape must be conceivable without museum guide describing or telling about it. And now, of course, the, the big question, and you may have noticed that I am not using the word wreck to describe it, I am using the word ship. We are exhibiting the wreck, but we are talking about ship. Because as far as I know, no ship has been built to become a wreck. They are built to become working, useful vessels. And um, therefore, when we are talking about wreck on display, we are actually talking about the whole story behind and around the vessel. I tried to make a little graphical representation of that. Yes, the wreck is there, but it's part of a ship's story. Behind that is the crew. Someone had to operate the vessel. There is cargo. It was a cargo ship. There are trade and merchants. Otherwise, there won't be any cargo. <laughs> and a little, maybe a little bit on the side, but still very much connected and very important, are harbors and trade routes, medieval town, and maybe, that is always the question for curators, politics and society that enabled all those things in shipbuilding, harbor development, cargo and trade. And also, when we are dealing with, a, with it as a ship, then we must understand that usually the ship is not built for exhibition. The ships are built to be, the ship's hull, hulls are built to be su supported by, with water from everywhere. And now, regardless how we put it in, on display, completely new, deformations will take place because the ship is in, in a very unusual environment for her. And visibility is the central question because, well, unfortunately, the, yeah. <laughs> this is a good picture to illustrate visibility. There is none. Uh, okay. Uh, here, at the seaplane harbor, we can see the, see the Maselin wreck, which is better. 
you can walk around it. It's, it's very clearly visible, all the details. Uh, and also the ship, original size, size and shape is very well illustrated with metal frame. How do we do it in a very confined space in Fat Margaret? Not very unusual, but new building was needed for the vessel. It, is, it has been the case for Vasa, it has been the case for Mary, Mary Rose and numerous other, other archaeological finds. So new building was created uh, in the former courtyard. Um, I have to hurry, I know. Um, so gradually it was um, uh, a lot of um, soil was removed to create the exhibition space. Um, and is it really visible? The transport frame, which was very, very good for cleaning and conservation and transporting the ship, was most definitely not suitable for exhibition. So a very courageous, I think, um, decision was made to use the internal support structure because the timbers are in very good shape. To illustrate, this is a little bit easier. Metal frames are were placed between the ship's frames uh, and they were fastened with metal belt around the ship in the, in the upper part and also tightened with um, ropes. And also a special frame was made for transport and lifting. So th just a couple of pictures about installing the, the, uh, the keel girder beneath the, the uh, under the keel and here you can see one detail of um, internal metal frame and in the museum you can practically not see the internal support structure so uh, it gives a impression of a very very clean um, exhibit and again under the cover of night it was transported and then it was lifted there was no roof back then. And um, yeah, the ship has landed. Um, <clears throat> so the next big question is what details should we put back? Because you can actually see that there are details missing. The hole that the excavator make, made uh, also in the bow, there are quite a lot of big pieces of uh, uh, ship's board uh, uh, missing. So uh, discussion, should we attach them back or not uh, were held and we decided against it uh, mostly because the, the, uh, the hull was already deformed a little bit so it, it would be extremely complicated and the second one uh, it would made it would make the ship very much heavier and harder to maintain so we decided against it and we decided that we exhibit it as it was found and finally artifacts and story how do we do that? Because the ship alone is impressive, but there is a lot and lot to tell about it. So one idea that we had is maybe we should put the artifacts back on the wreck as they were found. So to reconstruct the picture of archeological excavations. Mm, also because of the space available, we couldn't illustrate the original shape of the vessel with metal frame like it was done by Masilin. So we, we had to use digital solutions. And of course, for the sake of the objects themselves, we had to use climate control display cases. And I think, again, it is actually a good solution because they are much more visible, they are in better environment, and the visitor can look at them in, from a very close distance, so small details are visible. <coughs> and yes, uh, we had to use modern technologies for animations and, and hands-on solutions to, to put the ship really on, on water again. So what would be the future? Uh, of course, as an archaeological artifact and at the same time as a living ship, it needs constant care. Uh, so new laser scans and measurements must be made and maybe uh, the artifacts in display cases are not a big deal anymore because uh, virtual reality and 
all those digital solutions have already been tested in the museum and maybe at least virtually the artifacts will move back on, on the ship. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, I'm personally fascinated by this find because it's so complete and, and, and when I live in uh, Turku Archipelago, uh, we have lots of uh, place names regarding cogs like Krugvik and, and, uh, and Kug, uh, and, and so there's a lot of like traditional traces of, of, of harbor sites for these type of vessels. Also, there are lots of church, like paintings on church walls, just exactly exhibiting these cogs. And um, well, we don't know how it ended up to, in the bottom of the sea, but it would be fascinating to think that this vessel would also have been sailing up in a, along the Finnish coast and been, perhaps it's even painted in one of the churches. We <laughs> know. So, but uh, do you have an explanation for why it uh, was found, why it was on the bottom uh, of the apparently sunk and, and, and what was exactly the place where it was found in consideration to the uh, Tallinn Harbor at that time? The ship probably sank during storm. Uh, maybe it was anchored near the coastline and uh, uh, since there is uh, quite a lot of uh, western winds here, uh, there are actually historical accounts of uh, ships uh, in storm drifting westward, westward and ending up in the beaches uh, west of, of Tallinn Old Harbor. Uh, why it was sank, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, we don't know yet exactly. There are burn marks on the timbers, so there might be fire aboard. Uh, also, in the bow, uh, there is a parts of keel missing, uh, so that might be uh, a reason for sinking. Um, why it ended up there, uh, the location is interesting because we have the, the, the coastline has changed quite a lot. Uh, when, when the ship sank, it, it most probably was shallow water near the coastline at that time. Uh, we have land rise. Uh, but also the coastline was heavily filled with, um, in, in later centuries, uh, for example, with uh, uh, basically with ash from factories, and uh, it was essentially a landfill area, uh, various rubbish from from the from town and and all such things. So. So that created a very good uh, environment for, for a ship to preserve. Uh, but of course, the, 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 real, um, mm, the real reasons or very exact reconstruction is, is yet to be made about the sinking and its, uh, and its um, circumstances. Yeah, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. One thing that really uh, interests me about this finding is the short time from the excavation to, to the, uh, the sh uh, ship or vessel being in the museum and you have a, an excellent uh, exhibition. Uh, and also it's interesting to see your pictures uh, on the, the traveling of the ship uh, on the, uh, like a, a long resort through town. Uh, my question is, uh, since this is a conference also about the popularization and communication, how did uh, you work with the public during this process? Was this something that you were telling about in media or in your, your museum, like the process from excavation to exhibition? Was this something that they were go, uh, the public were able to follow? Uh, yes. Um, actually, uh, a small exhibition about the finds uh, was already present at the excavation site and uh, the building contractor was kind enough to erect a special platform so the visitors could climb up and, and see the excavation site, which was a, a very good publicity uh, trick, I think. Um, and also the, all the operation about lifting and transporting uh, was, uh, was very well covered by the media. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> well, as you know, not everyone um, reads the media, so when, when the ship uh, during the night time was on her way to the museum, 
uh, and there are quite a lot of pubs and restaurants on the way. Uh, so <clears throat> there might have been some people who stepped out of the pub to have a smoke and then see a ship going by and they might have thought that maybe I had a couple of drinks too much. Uh, so so that, uh, that happened. But uh, yes, uh, in the means of, uh, of media and publicity, it was very well, uh, it was very well um, uh, covered, I think, and it was very well received because there was a huge public interest uh, because of that. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'm Minna Koivikko from Finnish Heritage Agency, and I visited the site when you were excavating in 2015, so I agree with Anna that an amazing job and very in, in tight schedule. So um, uh, my question is that uh, now that you have uh, had this first step, and which is like a wow effect, but what about in the future? Do you have a possibility to continue research so that you will kind of uh, keep the case alive? So is your PhD uh, relating to this wreck or ship? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, yes. Uh, um, of course, everything is connected and uh, the project is very much alive. Uh, there, at the moment, there are actually some analyses in the laboratories and we are waiting for um, uh, results. Uh, the, this, uh, this find is, in, in, in that sense, it is so huge. There are so many questions, there are so many uh, artifacts and materials to, to look at uh, that it is nowhere near complete. And um, yeah, at, at the moment we are <coughs> still waiting for uh, the results of analysis, uh, but um, uh, we are uh, cooperating with again with students and uh, uh, researchers from from other uh, countries, uh, and we are actually preparing a book uh, about it, and uh, it should be uh, published uh, in uh, 2025 uh, for the 10th anniversary of the of the finding so uh, there we will make a, a first um, we will set a, new, a first like milestone but again it doesn't mean that it's it's nowhere near complete at least uh, one bachelor thesis has already defended on that one master thesis only about leather artifacts and i think there is more to be there there will be more of uh, of that research our next presenter is San Christian Clausen from uh, Helgeland Museum in Norway. Uh, her uh, research topics and interests uh, are uh, maritime history, trade, and transportation in northern Norway. And uh, as the curator of uh, long boat exhibitions, she will introduce uh, to us the exhaustive project uh, about this 500-year-old uh, boat. Uh, that was found on the island of Loven in the northern part of Norway. And of course, uh, she will introduce the museum that uh, is planned to be opened in 2023. Yeah. In the spring. Yeah. So, um, to talk about uh, more about the findings, the conservation and the composing of the exhibition, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me um, um, present. I work in the Helgeland Museum, which is um, um, not an island, as you can see on this map from 1539. It's a region in the south part of northern Norway. And uh, on the Olaus Magnus, Carta Marina, you see, the, you see Helgeland is thought to be an island. And um, the, um, the uh, monster, the sea monster, the red one, where you see the tail, it's about where this um, wreck was found. It's about the cargo weasel, um, about 12 meters long, 500 years old, as you said, and uh, it uh, became a wreck, and it was found in 1976. So now it's been taken up in, uh, excavated in 2007, and is now putting into an exhibition in a museum, and that's what I told it. It's becoming, not a ship again, or a boat, but a clenodium, because <laughs> that was often, ha often happens when you take old stuff, putting them in museum. It changed the identity, and so it's with this boat as well. And it's not, um, it's not uh, found in, it's found under sand, one meter of sand, first underwater and then under the sand. And so it's not, 
uh, it's not an object in the water. We are actually trying to get the water out of it in the conservation pro process, which is um, it is in now. Uh, I took uh, the picture from Bergen. Um, it uh, was a big um, trade city in Norway and is still today. Um, the Hanseatic people had an office there. And it, uh, this one's from, the drawing is from 5081, and it shows a lot of different kind of vessels. So that's why I took it with me, because we think this boat's been in the transportation line between northern part of Norway and Bergen with stockfish, uh, which ended up in Europe. So um, here you see the map of Curta Marina. You see the red uh, kraken, this uh, monster up there, and you see the tail, it's, that's where the boat is. Not exactly, but <laughs> it's from um, the maps from uh, the Nordic countries, and it's a, a lot of monsters on them. So uh, Lovun, where the boat is found, is an island and a society in the northern part of Norway. And um, it's uh, near the polar circle. It's out in the ocean, 28 kilometers from the mainland. Um, the nearest cities, I marked them in the middle picture, in the middle picture, you can see the nearest cities. It's uh, Moirana, and then you see up the red uh, point, it's Buda, it's the main city in this part of the area. Um, so here you see the island, Loven. It's um, dominated by this mountain, the Loven mountain. It's 625 meters below sea level. It so has a long time been a popular sailing mark for sea pilots and sailors, and it still is today, and today also for air pilots. And you see mountains in behind of it, it's called Trana, it's a neighborhood society, and um, the main route between the really northern part of Norway and Bergen was out there between those islands, uh, um, but you also had them on the inner side of this place, Loven, this mountain, mountain place. So this is where the, where the boat was, uh, the wreck was found. Uh, it's a place with stormy weather um, and it's typical coastal temperature with um, the lowest degree uh, for, for last uh, year was 7.8, which is very warm in Norway. <laughs> and uh, the warmest was 29.1, which was in the late of June. And the strongest wind uh, the last year 49.7 meter each second. It's very, it's a lot of wind, windy, very windy weather, and it's very hard to navigate in these areas. A lot of, a uh, lot of uh, small islands and things you can't see just below the sea. So uh, here you see the island today, and today it's 520 people living there, and it's a special community in Norway being along this coast because most of the societies has been removed and it's mostly um, um, elder people living there but in Loven you have the average age it's 30 years <laughs> very young and you have 80 pupils at the school and uh, 31 in the kindergarten uh, the picture is actually lying because uh, it looks like it's a lot of land but it's not the whole island is only it's um, five kilometers in quadrat and uh, it's only half of them, which is the living area, because it's a lot of mountain, but it depends on how you take the photograph, of course. So, um, we have uh, found remains that shows that uh, there have been people here uh, from the Stone Age. In that, uh, beside of that uh, stone, it's a cave, and you found um, different kind of tools there. But we're not sure if uh, people are living there on a permanent basis or maybe just in the season for catching fish and birds and so on. Uh, and they could be that the people disappeared uh, with the Black Death for in the middle of the 14th century. Uh, we're not quite sure. In this part of the country, it was 60% of the people died. and. Um, and then um, the one who survived maybe moved to p uh, places who were better for farming. So because we have found very few items from just around this area where the boat was uh, becoming a wreck. So we are wondering, could it be that the island wasn't populated? It could be kind of an outmark for people on near farms, hunting birds and so on. 
So here you see the population. It went from uh, seven, in seven, 1769, there were 35 inhabitants only. And in 1920, it was 186. And it was three farms in 1769. Uh, and it uh, slowly uh, expanded. So here we see the inhabitation is growing. And uh, we have uh, we have in the period after the war it kind of stagnated World War II it kind of stagnated for uh, some years but then it uh, it um, increased again and the people were living or fishing and farming was which is typical for this area and they were fishing for both eating the fish but mostly selling it and they were farming uh, for for getting their own clothes and food, mostly. They sold very few of the items from the farming. They had the, the land, is so, it's so small, but they had the cows and sheep to swim to the other islands to eat grass. And on Loven, you had a special treasure, uh, which was this bird. It's called um, uh, a puffin. And they had a lot of puffins on one side of the island, and they were hunting it for meat, eggs, and feather. And they exported the feathers uh, and also the meat. They salted it. And um, that's why it, it must have been a nice place to live if you wanted to catch birds, because it's a lot of them. And um, uh, so that's why we're wondering, maybe uh, it should have been people there in periods uh, catching birds. Maybe the vessel was a transportation for those stuff, those trades, marks. Uh, in 1972, there were two um, teachers from Loven, and uh, they, this was in the beginning of salmon farming or, or fish farming uh, in Norway, and they started up with, um, in the really, really early period. Uh, and in the beginning, it was just a side effect, but now, today, is a main living most people in Leuven live uh, working with Salmon Factory. A lot of people from other countries coming and working there. So, uh, it's an island, it's long from the mainland. The boats, all, boats always been necessary, uh, both to fish and the salmon farming and for transportation and for uh, farming as well. So, um, there are very few roads here. You only have five or four or five kilometers. And this is um, small. On the right picture, you can see a small island. Uh, on that island, it was a harbor. The name Holmholmval means where you take, um, yeah, where you put your boat. <laughs> uh, and in 1976, they were um, fixing the road there, uh, which you see on the right side, right side on the picture. Uh, and then. The man, uh, yeah, here is the picture of how, how that one looks today. You see the, um, the road there. Um, if you see it here, you see it near the beach. It goes by the beach because you put more land to it. And that was what the man was doing in 1976 where he, um, where he actually found the boat. Uh, he had a machine and he was taking sand to build a bigger road. And then he came nearby um, he found those uh, pieces of the boat. And the people, uh, they immediately understood it was an old boat because you could see it, uh, how it was made and the, um, yeah, the wood. And uh, also, no people living. You had a man who was 100 years old then, 106 maybe? No, 100. And he, uh, the old people said, no, we've never heard about a boat going down there because it's a lot of wrecks in the area. Uh, Actually, in the late 60s, a lot of Swedish divers came there to dive for wrecks, but they never heard about a wreck here because it was under sand. They couldn't see it. So um, they, um, they contacted the um, uh, museum in Norway, which is responsible for those kind of foundings, which is the Tromsø Museum. It's even further north than where this island is, uh, because uh, like in many other countries, uh, if a ship wrecks over, or ships or whatever you find in sea, who's over 100 years old, is a government who owns it if you can't find the owner. And for these old items like this, 
you can't find the owner <laughs> mostly. So um, then uh, it's a government who owns it, and you have the responsibility as museums. And for this part of the country, it's a Tromsø museum which is responsible. So they contacted them, and it came an archaeologist, and he took with him some some of the um, uh, some of the pieces back to Tromsø. But then the wreck was still lying under sand and water. And because uh, when the water is down, it's just sand, and when it's up, it's water and sand. Yeah. Um, they took the pieces he took with him. They tested it, and they found it was um, wood. The wood was oak from Agder, which is in the th southern part of Norway. Because uh, most boats made in northern parts, they are not made of oak, because there are no oaks there unless they are planted in your time. Um, and they dated it, uh, yeah, for carbonating uh, dating, and they had a, uh, it was a period for 150 years, it's from the medieval age, late medieval age. Uh, in the island, Loven, it was a lot of interest. They would like to have, have the wreck up. They would exhibit it and have it up. And they were working, uh, trying, uh, trying to make that happen. Uh, but <laughs> it took a long time, and um, here you see a man con called uh, Hans Petter Merlan. He was one of the teachers who started the salmon farming in 1972, and he, he, he was in interest groups of firms and private persons who would have the boat up. And they um, tried to, they tried to, uh, they said, we will pay for it. Uh, the local companies and the p uh, private persons will pay for it. But because of lack of t technology, it would be really hard to get the rack up when it was because of the water going up and down <laughs> back then. So it stopped. Uh, and then, um, then uh, uh, they started up again in 2015. And uh, they get um, in company with the Museum of Tromsø and the Maritime Museum in Oslo because um, the Maritime Museum in Oslo has been, um, they actually have the responsibilities for foundings in the water in the, in the eastern part of Norway, but they, um, uh, they have the expertise. So they cooperated with the ones in Tromsø and this interest group, and uh, they agreed we are going to take it up if we get the permission from the government, and we will exhibit it. And the local interest group would pay for all of it. Uh, and the reason uh, they, they get the permission to, ex, uh, to, to excavate it was um, because it's very few foundings from this period in the northern part of Norway. It's not like in, for instance, Tallinn, you have a lot of old buildings and everything around you. In this coastal climate, you have very few foundings. And uh, for instance, we have uh, 50 medieval wrecks about 50 medieval wrecks found in Norway, and it's only three parts from northern Norway. And this was the only uh, wreck. It's the other ones, uh, one of them is gone, and it's also a piece from, found outside Buda. But this was the only wreck you could take up. So, uh, and uh, this part of the country had an important history in exporting the dried cod. And uh, so that's why I got the reason to kind of material materialize this part of the history. And uh, you can ask why the um, local group pays for it, because it's really expensive. Uh, and they do it because it's an investment in the local society. They are really, uh, they are uh, very, um, uh, it should all happen locally. They invest the money they get from the salmon farming in the local community. Here you see a coffee bar. Uh, and boat uh, motors, engines from boats. It's combinated as a coffee bar, and they, they made like a golf, uh, golf uh, place, and they made this coffee place. They made the beach, they made the ice cream shop, they made a lot of uh, living buildings. They invest back in the, in the society, and that's what happened with this boat as well. In Norway, it's not that common um, to do so with archaeological sites. You usually you have um, low, uh, in private persons or companies paying for art or uh, museums exhibition, but where we sell them for archaeological projects. Usually it's um, 
Yeah, it's the uh, one who is supposed to build the road or something pays for it. Um, yeah, here you can see where the boat was found. It's marked with the red, red ring in the left picture. And the beach, beach they made is uh, on the right, and the trial paddling is uh, a little bit out of the red mark, but it's almost near where the boat was found. It's a better picture of it, the finding. And they made, uh, they made, to make the beach, they had to put up this wall. Uh, and the wall made it easier to excavate uh, the wreck because you could take the water out when you did it. You didn't have to be aware of how, how the water came up and down. So it got more cheaper than the first in, in um, the first, um, when they first tried to take it up. So uh, they made a preliminary examination in 2016. People from uh, the Maritime Museum in Oslo and um, also from Trums Museum. The two women you see at the pictures, the one on the right, she's actually from Leuven. She took her master in archaeology because she was so, she would like to know more about um, archaeology in her island. And the one who is uh, standing on the right picture, she, she's name is Tori Falk, and she was a leader from, um, from the Oslo, uh, the museum in Oslo. More pictures from um, the examination in 2017. The weather was really good with a lot of sun, and that's good for the people, but not for the boat. <laughs> Shouldn't be in the sunny weather. And here you see, you see pictures from the excavation. Uh, the man on the left side, he's from Trump's Museum, and he, um, he uh, studied the artifacts and the, re the remains. And he found out that uh, uh, actually, even though it was 20 or 30 artifacts, it was few to be a boat. And it, he found out they must have um, kind of, um, well, <laughs> He think it's sunken on purpose because the stones who were in the boat was placed in kind of way that it couldn't have been ballast, and it was actually a few, few remains, and most of the remains had been put put uh, to fix the boat. It would have been an old boat uh, near to sink, <laughs> so so uh, it was very. Um, he we, he got a lot of knowledge by studying the remains. Uh, and they were storing it locally and drawing it. And on the picture to the right, you see a so-called FARC arm to 3D deconstru deconstruct it. And it's actually no a museum item because <laughs> it's out of date already. It's in 2017. Um, and here it's a 3D model. They made it um, digitally and uh, physically. And so they had and in this uh, excavation, they had a lot of um, audience. Uh, it was open for school children and media and so on. And they had a day w days where they told about the boat to uh, the audience. And the um, conservation pro process is going on in a container on the island. It's a special made container. They first, uh, they put it in wax peg and then they took uh, they are going to take the rest of the water out by uh, drying freezing it. Here's inside the container. And the conservators from Oslo are regularly coming up and testing uh, how long will it take to get the water out. The pieces who was taken to Tromsø in 1976 are back. We are now trying to find out how to exhibit them because they are so different from the other ones who's in the container. So we're not quite sure. They are really destroyed actually. Meanwhile, the house is uh, done. It's built a, a house where it's supposed to be, the boat, when it's done conservating. Uh, it's not done yet, should be this year. It's not going to be. We're opening the exhibition without a boat, actually, <laughs> in 28th of May, 2023. And here you see a boat cradle. It's made uh, after copies uh, from Roskilden, how they do it there and you can walk around the boat up to a podium where this, you see the boat from all places so uh, here's a model of a boat 
We have three models, one 3D and two models made by, made by uh, local men trying to figure out how could this boat have been lucky. And the finding um, are unique in other Norway settings as only both from the Middle Age discovered and preserved in the region. While composing the exhibition about and around the boat, we have to construct this history because we know so little. Uh, but as source material, the boat can enrich the opportunities for interpretation and understanding of the past, and we need to put it in context to history as well. We still have a lot of questions, and we haven't, uh, many of them will never find us answer to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for a very, very fascinating presentation. I think uh, what is very uh, appealing in this is that uh, the local little community is taking this kind of really great task, and I think it uh, must build a lot of like good spirit for the village and, and for the whole island. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, it is, and um, also all the pupils at schools are taking stones, writing their names and putting around the boat. And they should all do so in the future, so you can come back and see your name. I just have one question. I was just wondering, how does it fit in the way it was constructed, the vessel, into the Nordic tradition of, of, I presume it was, uh, you know, uh, cl clinker built, I suppose. Yeah, uh, it's a clinker built boat and it's a typical um, cargo vessel. It's not a war vessel or a fishing vessel, definitively not. And but we haven't, we can't put it into a category saying it's like, a, uh, well, it's like that kind of boat or that kind of boat. It's just a cargo vessel. <laughs> I would have the question. Um you showed one of the models uh, on one of the pictures, and it had uh, the mast and rigging. Uh, um, how and uh, with help, what finds uh, this type of rigging was uh, was created for for the model? Yeah, actually, first they couldn't find any any rest of the mast, but then they found a piece which was a little bit outside where the rest of the boat was and they found out it must have had one mast, and we guess this sail, you know, I don't know the <laughs> English okay. name, the raw sail, called mm. in Norwegian, uh, and it definitely hasn't been a boat for rowing. Mm. <laughs> and also, they weren't sure it was a deck, uh, but uh, when they reconstructed it, they saw it must have been a deck, because otherwise you couldn't have reached, you couldn't have navigated it. And also, the most of the items found was under a place where the guess the half deck would have been. Hmm. What information about the uh, reason for sinking and being in, in, in this spot? Yeah, uh, the, the Stephen Wickler, the MS, um, research researcher from uh, marine archaeologist from Trump's Museum, he means uh, it would have been sunken on purpose because of the way the stone uh, were placed and because there are no left of the cargo. So uh, they, they kind of ribbed it and then sank it. But we don't know <laughs> why, maybe co co because it was really in, in a bad shape. Uh, but also then we ask why didn't the people use the rest of it? Because this island has almost no trees and they would be invaluable timber for making houses or other boats or whatever. And it could be because the island wasn't inhabited. Could also be because of the laws who forbid them to take it. <laughs> We're not sure. Uh, we will. Uh now travel to uh, Sweden, uh, from where we will welcome uh, Patrick Höglund, uh, who is the research coordinator and maritime archaeologist at Wrack, uh, the Museum of Wrecks. And uh, currently is involved in the project The Lost Navy, Sweden's Blue Heritage from 1450 to 1850. Uh, his presentation will focus on the Wrack Museum and its long-term work in the preservation of underwater heritage. Uh, and this work also includes uh, work with public and private partners and uh, all other entities who want to make underwater maritime heritage more accessible. And of course, this gives rise to the question, how can the wrecks uh, be researched and presented to the public in a sustainable way? So please, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone, nice to be here. Uh, 
I'm Patrick Höglund from REC, Vrak, Museum of RECs. I'm going to talk about um, uh, how we do research and try to make the maritime heritage more accessible to the public, in short. Um, this is, of course, you know this, everyone here, but still, I have to say it. Uh, and I also start with a picture that shows not wrecks, but other remains on the seabed. But uh, most notably is, of course, the wooden wrecks. Uh, uh, along the Swedish coastline, especially in the archipelagos, we have uh, you know, numerous wrecks. Uh, you can't count them. And we keep finding new interesting wrecks. Um, Earlier on, as mentioned before today, there was uh, this philosophy of salvage and excavate, if you had the money. Um, and sometimes, there was a lot of focus on prestige objects, of course, uh, and sometimes these um, investigations were good. They were good research, they had um, great reports and articles and whatever and also material from, for uh, museum exhibits. But there was also a lot of damage done to the wrecks, both from archaeologists, museums, and uh, private entrepreneurs b before we had the law change in Sweden in 1967. But even after that, for, you know, when I started diving for a couple of decades, it was a, a salvage philosophy that uh, um, was uh, in power in society. Uh, to the left you can see a wreck that was salvaged, uh, um, excavated in the 70s and 80s. It was a very good excavation, a lot of um, research, a lot of knowledge came from that wreck, but now it's just an empty shell. It's not a very nice dive if you're not really interested in the con construction of the hull. To the right is a private entrepreneur bef before the uh, law changed in 1967 that really destroyed the wreck. Often there was collabor collaboration be between museum authorities and uh, uh, private divers that, okay, uh, you can excavate or you can dig in this area if we get 50% of the fines or if you promise to do a good documentation and so on. And in most cases, this never happened. They brought out, up the stuff tried to sell it, and a lot of stuff was just destroyed, lying and uh, like the Lovund piece from 1972. They, they were not conservated. It was just left to dry. And that also happened in museum storage. So uh, both museums and private people did uh, some bad things. Uh, <clears throat> of course, sometimes we need to excavate uh, contract archaeology or if, you know, society grows and uh, infrastructure, they have to build a road or a port, build a road or a port or whatever. Uh, so, but this is not uh, what I'm going to talk about today. It's more about uh, research archaeology, what we choose to do. Uh, <clears throat> and how, how do we do research in a sustainable way? Is it even possible? We think so. And we want to leave that era of excavate and salvage and now do uh, sustainable research. Uh, and also, as said before, we, ha we have now great opportunities to preserve and vis visualize uh, uh, our wrecks and our heritage underwater through, for example, 3D modeling. Uh, of course, we do excavate sometimes, but only if we have, a, you know, the research questions, we have a conservation, we have funds for storage, and, and so on. And often in a minor scale. <clears throat> uh, this is Kraven, an unknown wreck from uh, uh, the first, the founder of the Swedish fleet in 1522, when some ten ships were bought from Lübeck by Gustavus Vasa, the Swedish, uh, the nation founder of Sweden. Uh, he bought the, those ships and never paid Lübeck, but one of the ships 
sank in the Swedish archipelago just a couple of years later. It's called the Kraven, that's Kravel, Kravel ship. Um, th this is uh, it's on purpose, I put it upside down. You have to wait. Uh, <clears throat> this is a good plan from you know, some 20 years ago. It's a really good plan of the wreck site. But what it doesn't show is that the wreck is actually lying on a, a rock. There's a steep mountain going down underwater and there's a rock shelf which continues down. And most part of the wreck is lying on that shelf, which is very hard to see on this uh, uh, drawing, 2D drawing. The rock goes up there and down where the main mast is. So if you have a 3D model, it's much easier to visualize this. And you can also see the stern part really broken, ha hanging down. <clears throat> if we had a, this is done in maybe two days. If we had a couple of more days, we could have um, visualized more of the rock and also follow the main mast down to 40 meters something and follow the rock up a bit so you can get that dramatic landscape view also. And of course, if we, we could make the actual wreck another color than the rock. But it becomes a, more, a little more dramatic if you compare these two images of the wreck. Uh, also, as you all know, open doors all the time for me here. Uh, you can visualize, uh, for example, the break here where the ship is hanging over the side. Uh, small finds like cannonballs, uh, pieces of cargo, and so on. Uh, a tool we have used in recent years is what we call management plans, or actually in Swedish it's, they're called care and protection plans. We decided for this translation now. We try to make them more or less standardized, but of, of course they develop through the years. We haven't been doing them for so many years. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you an example now from the wreck uh, Resande Man, um, a wreck that also is e exhibited in our museum. Uh, <clears throat> we, we try to do a 3D model and a you know, fairly good documentation of the wreck site. We don't excavate. Uh, we um, survey the ship f for the finds, uh, 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 and the idea is to get, uh, I don't know the word in English, to, to get a uh, zero mode, so we can follow what happens with this wreck in years to come. Because often there is rumors around uh, divers or archaeologists that, oh, this thing broke on this wreck, or uh, someone stole this uh, artifact from the wreck, but nobody knows really what happened and when it happened. So th this is a way to manage the wreck, um, to see what happens with it uh, over forthcoming years. Natural degra uh, degradation, eventual looting or whatever. Uh, besides the 3D and the, you know, the standard documentation, we also might try to make a site uh, artifact plan where we have all the finds. We, we uh, uh, try to find a couple of hot spots wh where uh, you know, an interesting artifact is, or maybe a piece that eventually will break in the hull and take pictures from the same angle of that uh, area. So we can go back and see what happens w uh, with that. That's called the, the photo stations. Um, Yes. Uh, often we do this in collaboration, uh, especially in the Stockholm area, with the Coast Guard, the police, uh, counterboards, other authorities. And the management plans can be a tool for them when they, they want to you know, protect the wrecks. The Coast Guard can go out and dive uh, on these wrecks by themselves. They can look at the photo stations in the management plan. Okay looks the same or something has happened and report to us. It can also, also be a tool for divers, of course most of the wrecks are accessible for divers, uh, diving also is okay on them, so they can have them as a, 
a study before the dive and now learn more about the wreck site. How long do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Uh, they can also be a tool for creating dive parks, which we have a, an example in uh, uh, the Swedish uh, Stockholm archipelago. And also now a dive park is planned in the so south of Sweden in Karlskrona area. Uh, <clears throat> the material collected can also be of further use, for example, in museums, like we have done with this uh, resande man, traveling man in English. Um, famous wreck, uh, uh, shipwreck sank in 1660 on a diplomatic mission to Poland in the Stockholm archipelago. Um, the 3D model we made on Rea Man has been reused as a, a plan on the floor in the exhibit. Uh, we have also, also taken pictures of the frames. In, this is all in scale one to one to create an uh, underwater environment when you're actually in that room. Uh, the artifact plan has also been used for uh, showcases, showcases uh, in the exhibit. This is what we had when we went out to collect more mat material than we had in the management plan by order from the exhibition people. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of, uh, lot of diving actually. And we also made new 3D models of the actual artifacts on the seabed without bringing them to the surface. So we, we made 3D models of them on their actual spots they were laying uh, on the seabed in the wreck. And then other people made holograms of them, which are now right above the fine spot on the wreck in the exhibit room. So the idea is to, you know, uh, create an underwater environment for the visitors. Uh, <clears throat> besides, uh, if you talk about um, accessibility to the public or reaching out to the public, besides the museum and the management plans, which, which are on our home page, you, everybody can download them. Um, we also do a lot of social media now, like other people here do. Um, we, we try to do live broadcasts on Facebook, for example, where we show work in progress. We're working with a 3D model. Somebody's talking about, uh, you know, the actual dive. Somebody might come up from a dive. We, we interview them live. And we also now are working with a, a way to broadcast from the actual wreck uh, wh when it happens, the research or documentation happens. Uh, okay, a little bit work in progress. We, we, we have a big project called the Lost Navy with a, a lot of colleagues um, involved in. Minna, for example, sitting up there. Um, this is an interdisciplinary project with a lot of people from ethnologists, historians, archaeologists. Uh, the aim with the Lost Navy is to study the Swedish sailing navy the wooden ships, um, you know, from the early stages up until steam, steam ships around 1850. Uh, one area we have been uh, studying hard is that we know that there's a lot of wrecks in this area is the Vaxholm area in Stockholm. Vaxholm fortress is built as a, a lock to uh, the archipelago, the main waterway to Stockholm. Uh, and from uh, the 1550s, they tried to block all the straits around to lead the traffic through. Um, so the traffic and eventual, eventually enemies had to pass the fortress. Uh, and a couple of years ago, we found in one of these straits two middle-sized warships from 1648. Uh, but there's been a lot of things happening in this area. They have put a lot of stones in some of the straits, covering wrecks. There have been a lot of um, cleaning up in the straits later on. 
So we didn't actually know what wrecks uh, could be preserved that were mentioned in historical records. Um, and last year in December, we found a big wreck with two rows of gun ports. You know, just like the Vasa. Uh, and we were, of course, <coughs> excited. We have been looking for... Uh, okay, let me get back to that. that uh, the sides of the ship had fallen out, and we're actually li lying, one of the sides were lying on another wreck that we don't know uh, which it is yet. It's a slightly smaller wreck, but we concentrated on this one. Oh no, you see that's applet now. Uh, I'm going to tell you that later. Uh, <laughs> this is if you put the sides up again, but, but it's actually more preserved than this. It's a lot of this part also preserved lying here on the, on the seabed, and a lot of uh, structure has fallen also in to the ship. Uh, we returned this spring in April and m made a more thorough documentation. Last year it was only one dive. Um, and the ship behind here is the Vasa as it looked like when she was brought up, because Vasa has been reconstructed quite heavily actually. So the Vasa also a lot of pieces had fallen down, which they collected from the seabed later. Uh, the wreck had <coughs> roughly the same size as the Vasa, uh, uh, and we were we knew that one of Vasa's sister ships, most probably Eplet, there were three sister ships built after Vasa by the same shipbuilder, uh, and. There are some um, historical sources that, you know, they go back and forth. So, but the, the most reliable one says that Eplet should have been sunk in this strait. And Eplet, the royal orb, the, the apple. That's why a lot of Swedish ships were uh, called after royal regalia. Uh, and we saw also a lot of uh, timbers that were very similar to the Vasa. That's easy to say, maybe. We did a lot of research on board the Vasa also. But actually, this timber, a long um, stringer it's called, I think, uh, stinnare in Swedish, it was a typical Vasa size. We haven't seen it on other ships. Uh, last say, I saw on the Kronan project, haven't seen it on Kronan. Uh, we didn't see it on the ships we found before in 6048 or other known warships. It's a long timber supporting the decks uh, uh, and the whole structure stretching from the hold up right to where the upper gun deck starts. That, that, that was a great... Um, and other details also pointed towards the Vasa. Then we also had from historical records measurements um, uh, of Eplet that should be roughly one meter wider than the Vasa, which this wreck showed to be when we measured a number of deck beams and did calculations from them. Also, we had a, a, a dendro sample saying that the wood was felled in 1627 when Eplet actually was, uh, they started to build Eplet. So, finally, we think we have the right ship this time, Eplet, the sister ship to Vasa. Um, and the idea with, with the museum and archaeologists working in close collaboration has been to present finds and, uh, uh, you know, this, the idea is to create a lot of action around the museum. Uh, what happens in uh, real time, real time, what happens at the moment, live uh, broadcast and so on. Uh, and finally, at least, at last, we made... Uh, created an exhibit. The idea has, has been to create small exhibits when we find something. And now we finally uh, got to do that, which we will try to continue with uh, 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 future projects. So this is a small e exhibit made real fast in the museum showing, you know, for example, dendro samples. Visitors think it's great to just see a piece of wood from that actual ship. Uh, and some other uh, uh, screens showing uh, what's happening with the wreck. Uh, this, this delivers something extra. It presents brand new research. Even before we have done, you know, published any articles or reports about the wreck. And I think that's a, a, 
a great thing, actually, and the public really appreciates that. Thank you. Are you going to look into the, how do you say, the multidisciplinary approach is like uh, the tides and how it fell apart and all that, because they did a similar research on HMS Invincible and looking at how the filament and all of those processes happened. Is it going to be done on Applet as well? Uh, what is it called? Site uh, formation. Site formation, formation project. Yeah, yeah, eventually. We, we haven't been there a lot. One day last year and four days this year. So we're, uh, and about the multidisciplinary uh, things, that's more uh, the broader project, the Lost Navy. So uh, a lot of people have their different projects not connected to Applet. We, we have, a, a, you know, the empirical part of the project. We try to find and identify as many wrecks from the sailing Navy as possible. So we can't actually, or we don't have the time to go into detailed research of everyone. Applet will probably be a little more focused on than, than other wrecks, you know, because it's the connection to Vasa and so on. But we have uh, identified a lot of uh, wrecks now. And we're, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to Karlskrona to uh, survey another barrier of ships between two small islands there. So uh, we'll see about the site formation process. We, we will go back this spring, but see what happens. First of all, we, need, we want to look behind the wreck, see, you know, are the sculptures left? Did they, did they take them away before this was uh, sunk? I was just wondering, uh, what uh, historical sources are available um, as regards um, paper trail or such in Sweden as regards to connection to the Lost Navy, or if you care to comment on that a little bit? Uh, so for some parts of, for example, the 1600s, we have good uh, records of, uh, you know, what ships was built. But it, the, it's, uh, for the 1620s, for example, there's a good record and uh, later, but it differs. Some material is lost. We have good records of what was built, uh, when, which year. So if we take a dendro sample, we can, you know, maybe we, we also have the, the length of uh, ships. Uh, there are armament lists, uh, stuff like that. There are also in letters, you know, from the ad admirals to the king mentioning what happens on the ships. There are, um, uh, what do you call it, um, material from the court. You know, if there's trouble on board, so in, in that material is really interesting. You can find not the admirals, but maybe the common people they stealing from the sh ship stores or whatever. There's a lot of lots of different materials, but uh, the, the ship's list is the first we look at to find uh, if it says uh, where when was it built, you know, for Dendro, uh, where did it uh, sink, do we have the area, do we have wrecks in that area and uh, the, the size of the ships. What, that's what we need for identification. Th this project focuses a lot of, uh, on identification. Not the whole project, but this uh, part in the project. The idea is to create an atlas of the Swedish Navy as Rex. We will continue with the Museum of Rex. Uh, we will have uh, Johanna uh, from the Swedish Maritime Museum. Uh, who was the project manager for the exhibition at the Museum of Rex. Uh, and uh, online we will be joined by Andreas Braula, uh, uh, who on the other hand was a uh, uh, production manager and designer from the Expology Experience Design Studio uh, that uh, together with uh, the Museum of Rex uh, produced uh, exhibition there and their presentation will introduce to us the questions the team uh, at the museum were looking answers to uh, and I hope uh, that uh, uh, the examples that you show us will give good answers to us all uh, who are dealing with the same questions in our exhibitions so the floor is yours thank you yes. Thank you very much and thank you for letting me come here and thank you also for the previous presentations. That's been really interesting also. Uh, yes, so I work as a project manager of exhibitions and uh, most recently worked with uh, the exhibitions in Vrak, Museum of Rex. 
And uh, I will just give a brief presentation of the exhibitions and um, <clears throat> the project as a whole, uh, the exhibition project. And then I will hand over to my colleague Andreas Braula from uh, uh, the exhibition Design Studio Expology. And he will talk a little bit more in depth about the exhibitions. So, yes. So, here you can see we have 900 square meters uh, exhibi exhibition area at the museum and it consists of five different exhibitions. And uh, on the ground floor, as you can see here, the visitors enter the exhibition below the surface of the Baltic Sea. So the first exhibition we call the Sea of Memories. It's the one located to the right. And that is basically an immersive film experience where the visitors can encounter the voice of the Baltic Sea. And uh, the film is projected on a mesh, which is uh, see-through, and behind the mesh, uh, as you can see in this concept pictures, we actually do have uh, quite a few objects. And um, even though, as you have heard before, we consider the Baltic Sea to be our storage, where the uh, items are best preserved, uh, we do have, I think, around 250 objects in the museum as a whole. Uh, so the second exhibition, you have already seen some examples from Patrick. Um, the exhibition Ries on the Man, where the visitors go to the wreck site, basically, uh, in that room. And also Andreas will talk a bit more about that exhibition. Uh, but the concept is that the visitors are still below the surface on the ground floor. They then move up the stairs to the second floor, and uh, the first exhibition, which you can see in this concept pictures uh, to the left, is called The Divided Sea. And here we have a good example of the cooperation that we had with different museums and institutions surrounding the Baltic Sea. So we have um, loans, items from different museums that we exhibit in this exhibition. Um, then we have the uh, more interactive exhibition that we call the assignment. And here we can um, let the visitors try to be a uh, marine archaeologist. Uh, they can play a game with three interactive stations uh, and try other um, interactive stations in this uh, exhibition as a whole. Uh, at the end, we have a small exhibition that we call the epilogue, which is sort of a mirror experience where the visitors uh, look beneath the surface again and uh, hopefully comes up uh, through the surface and walks out from the, the um, exhibitions with a new uh, renewed view of the Baltic Sea and what lies beneath the surface, of course. So, um, in 2017, the concept of the exhibition started to take shape, and it was, as um, Patrick has mentioned, a close cooperation between the marine archaeologists, of course, their work is the base of the exhibitions, and the exhibition design studio Expology, where we had the exhibition producer and the exhibition designer. So the aim was to create exhibitions that were both authentic, magic, and also had that human experience at core. So in 2019, this concept was ready. And we started the process of finding uh, someone who could produce uh, in the sense of both build the scenography, the showcases, uh, provide the hardware, but also to um, <clears throat> uh, provide um, multimedia content and develop the interactivities in the museum. So we had a procreation pro uh, process, which uh, ended in early 2020. And then the Dutch company Bruns, really big company, that's, uh, they have built a lot of exhibitions and also museums all around the world, very experienced. Uh, they were assigned this project. So, as we all know, uh, early 2020, we had just uh, been to Holland and the contract was signed. We had the pandemic um, situation. And we had to handle the continuing process of doing the exhibitions uh, within the restricted frames that we now had to deal with. So, here you can see some pictures from Bruns. And um, 
the ex exhibitions were developed and also built in Holland, and um, <clears throat> they were approved and discussed through uh, many, many Zoom and Skype meetings. We were exchanging a lot of emails with pictures, uh, but we were actually not able to go to Holland and look at the exhibits. Uh, I think one time the exhibition producer, uh, technical producer and designer uh, went to Holland, but otherwise the production and the approval was made totally digitally. Uh, of course, they came to Stockholm and started to build exhibitions, um, but since we had the pandemic with the restrictions, we had the second wave and the third wave in Sweden, so uh, they were actually prevented from coming uh, at several occasions to finish the exhibitions. So, um, <clears throat> it took about, sorry, uh, took about a year longer than expected but we opened the exhibitions in September 2021, a little bit more than a year ago. And uh, a lesson that we learned, because we were forced to use other means than uh, sort of discussing things being in the same room or in the same place, it was that it was actually um, easy or uh, it was doable to use digital tools, not only in the exhibition, but also throughout sort of the managing and implementing process of the project, even a project as big as this one. So yes, now I will leave the floor, uh, digital floor at least, to Andreas, who will talk a little bit more about the concept of the exhibitions. So, hi everybody. Um very happy to join you digitally. I've been following the, the presentation this morning and it's been really interesting. As Johanna was talking about, uh, Vrak, the Museum of Rex, is a new museum that tells about the cultural her heritage preserved beneath uh, the waters of the Baltic Sea. Now, as Patrick was talking a little bit also about, of course, today it's, it's a very nice idea to preserve artifacts below the surface because it's, it, uh, it, it gives so much better preservation. So of course, at Rock, we, we show the cultural heritage that is preserved best under uh, the surface. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's a nice thing that you work in this way, artifacts for, for later generations and so on. But as, as an ex exhibition producer, it, it is a little bit of a challenge, of course, because most exhibitions uh, in museums today uh, are dependent on artifacts. And when we were supposed to build rock, we didn't have those artifacts. Uh, so at first, this was a challenge. Uh, and how, sh how should we do it and so on? Uh, and then, of course, we started to, to notice that there was a lot of new methods uh, for creating 3D models. So what I want to do now is actually show you some examples of where this problem can arise uh, and how we address these problems when building uh, the exhibitions at Rock uh, Museum of Rex. Um, starting with the first um, example, uh, now this is Reza de Man, Man, as Patrick has already uh, shown you. Um, uh, as he was saying, uh, this is a, a ship that sank 1660. Uh, it's quite well described in a witness statement from that time, uh, from Andreas Bjug, who was one of the survivors from this ship. Um, and, um, and that witness statement, we actually have that in one room, just by the side of this big room. So we have an actor, uh, reading the witness statements, that is a really detailed description of what happened the night when the boat went under. Uh, but in this room, we have this uh, scale one-to-one -one drawing on the floor, uh, and that means that the visitors sort of can actually walk around in the room. They can walk as if they were on the wreck, on, on the site. Uh, and since we have suspended the showcases right above the, the location of the artifacts, that we show in the showcase, or to be more precise, the 3D representation of the artifacts, because we show them as holograms, uh, the, the old technique of Pepper's Ghost in these showcases. Uh, so by uh, having them uh, right above, we quite clearly state where they are from originally uh, on the 
upscale one-to-one -one, um, drawing on the floor. Uh, so of course, from, from, from my point of view as an exhibition producer, we do several things here. For one, we, we place the digital representation in a showcase. Uh, and that in itself is a way of elevating uh, the digital representation, telling the audience that it's something important. And the other thing is that we, by showing so clearly and presenting where it comes from, uh, on what, where it is situated on the wreck, we sort of present its provenance. Um, I hope I use, use that term in the right way, but we, we present its origin. Uh, and we're of course hoping that this would kind of reinforce the feeling of authenticity uh, when the visitor looks at the representations. Another interesting thing in this room uh, is that uh, we have actually one object from this wreck that is salvaged. That is a coin, uh, and I think the reason for it for being salvaged from the beginning was that we uh, that the, the marine archaeologists wanted to uh, prove the provenance of the wreck itself. Uh, and of course, we wanted to show that coin. So that coin is showed in one of the showcases, just by the side of the digital representation and the holograms. Uh, that coin in itself, of course, has this aura, uh, I mean, in the sense of that emotionally charged connection that visitors can have when they are looking at the real object. Uh, it's something that is felt that this is the real thing. Uh, and by showing this coin just by the side of the digital representation, we of course want to, to try to borrow a little bit of that feeling. We want to, to borrow that aura and make sh uh, and wish for the visitors to look at the digital representations and feel that a little bit of that emotionally charged connection. Now, I'm not sure we manage with everyone. Uh, I think all the visitors are different. Uh, I think this is a quite hard thing to do. Uh, but this is our intention to do, and I think we, we managed to, to create that, uh, that charged uh, connection, the emotionally charged connection, uh, with some of the visitors. So, moving on um, to uh, another part of the exhibitions, where we have a VR experience. Uh, this is a place where the visitor can dive down in with VR headsets uh, to the wreck of Anna Maria. Uh, it's a little game. They have the mission to find three objects and make photographs on them. Um, and here we're also working with the 3D model. It's an actual scan of a whole shipwreck. It's a quite impressive 3D model, I must say. Um, and we sh you can compare, we had two choices when we did this uh, VR experience. We had the choice of, of using the 3D model or actually using as a base and make a 3D artist uh, make a cleaner version of the same model. Uh, but I think it was quite clear that we wanted to, sh to show the real model, uh, the re real 3D scan. Uh, and as it is with this kind of, I think it's called uh, photogrammetry, this way of working when you take a lot of photos and you let the computer count them in so that it comes with the real 3D model. It, it always gives some defects on the model. Uh, but we thought that this was something good. You can actually see that in the middle circle. Uh, I hope you see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Um, and this, I think, also gives the idea that it is in comparison to what the visitors are used to in computer games, this clean, modeled, uh, 3D artist way of doing this kind of things. I think this looks a little bit more scientific. It looks a little bit more out, out, uh, authentic. Uh, and I think this is also quite a good place to actually stay a little bit and think about um, the bigger question, uh, that when, when working with museums, of course, we have to trust to uh, to make sure we perceive, uh, we keep that trustworthiness. Uh, that is very important for for institutions like museums, of course. Uh, and it is a challenge when when doing this kind of when we're adapting to new technologies and we, we we bring in gamification and so on. It's also a challenge when we when we simplify things. We we tend to it's always 
it's a good thing to, to have in mind. It's a good thing to discuss, I think. Um, moving on to the next room. Um, uh, this is in the start of the museum, the first exhibition. And here we have a room um, where we tell the long history of the Baltic Sea with projections on, on three walls and the ceiling. Um, and we also, of course, have, have music and we have a soundscape and we also have a voiceover. It's actually the, an actor that, uh, that tells the story of the, about the Baltic Sea and, uh, and pretends to be the Baltic Sea in itself. So it's a quite a dramatic story, quite suggestive. Um, and as you can see here, we have 3D models that is totally opposite of the last model I showed, because this is really done by a 3D artist and it's quite clean. Uh, and to make sure that this had the feel of authenticity, we worked quite hard to add details that were historically correct. So I'm very happy that we could work so closely in connection to Patrick, for example, and it really helped us to, to make these models um, really detailed and, and have correct details, historically correct details. Uh, and this is, of course, definitely one way of, of, of adding authenticity, perhaps the best way of doing it. Uh, and when we're talking about this projecting a film on uh, that really surrounds the visitor, um, I would really like to, to say that that is, of course, also a way of, of making uh, the experience feel real for the visitor, from the visitor points of view. Uh, and I, I will get back a little bit to that later on, but this is something we do here. Now, if we continue with that concept, um, with the concept of immersion, immersion of, of dipping the, the visitor in, in the experience in one way, then we have a quite large toolbox. Immersion can, of course, be seen as many things, but one thing is like you, you have the, the you take away the, the frame of the screen that we usually show things on and you add depth and dimension. So in this room, that is the, the last room of the museum, we have underwater footage that is projected in the uh, ceiling. Uh, but the visitor is actually seeing the footage, the film, uh, in the reflection on a mirror on the floor. So that gives the illusion that the underwater footage is situated at, uh, like two meters under the floor. Uh, and the, the mirror becomes a little bit like the water surface, something you stand and you look through the mirror down to the things that is on the seabed. Uh, so this is also, of course, an illusion that to make things real or feel real, at least. Um, is it authentic? I don't know. Uh, I mean, you obviously notice that I start to use the, uh, the term authentic in a more and more unprecise way, um, which is also interesting. And I'm, I'm getting back to that later on. Uh, in this room, we also have show things that is situated. Uh, it's footage from sites that's situated very close to the museum. So when you walk out from this room, you can you, you have a huge window and you can actually see the Baltic Sea, or at least in part of the Baltic Sea, the water that is close to Stockholm. And you can see at least one or two of these locations that we showed the footage from. And that is also, again, showing the origin of the footage, trying to make it feel as more authentic. Uh, and my last example is uh, this one, where we have added senses. Um, now, this is, uh, here we talk about the case of, of Frau Maria. Um, it's a ship that um, brought uh, luxury goods to Catherine the Great and the Russian nobles. Uh, and one thing it brought was coffee, which was a very, of course, expensive pleasure at that time. Um, and right in front of this uh, lady that you see in the picture, we have a, a big film showing the coffee going round in water. So we kind of give an idea of what happened when the ship sank. Uh, and we also have the, some coffee beans, the actual original coffee beans that were salvaged from the shipwreck right by side. But we also wanted to make 
the visitors feel a little bit what Catherine the Great and the Russian nobles felt when when they uh, ate and drank this coffee, maybe they didn't eat it, but when they had to held this coffee in their hand. Uh, and what was this uh, quite expensive pleasure all about? Uh, so, of course, here we're really talking about immersion. We're talking about making the experience feel real. Um, but are we talking about authenticity? I don't know. Uh, as you notice, the further I get, the more I talk about this, uh, the more I leave, I'm, I'm changing a little bit the definition of authenticity, uh, and perhaps I'm even diluting it a little. So I'm uh, diluting the term a little bit, but I'm sort of going from from a stronger sense of the term, the meaning of being of undisputed origin, and now I'm more and more using it in a weaker sense of the term, meaning more like faithful to an original, or in this case even. I mean, here we're talking about an interpretation of something we thought that the noblemen felt when they drank the coffee. So we're getting further, further away from what authenticity might be. Uh, and is this a problem? Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, like in this case, we didn't think we thought it was worth it to give the visitor an experience. Uh, but at the same time, I think it it is something to definitely be, be that we should discuss. Uh, and I'm very happy to, like when we work, worked with Rock, to have collaborated with different persons who had different opinions on these kind of things. Uh, because if we have different opinions, we can discuss it and we can sort of find out what is the right balance. So because we want to give the visitors an experience and we wanted to do it through new mediums, but we don't want to lose the authenticity and the trustworthiness uh, that comes with, with that authenticity. So to summarize a little bit, I hope I haven't been too, talking to, for too long. Um, there are, um, I would say, like to say like this, that for me, e museum is a place for education uh, where culture can be learned from artifacts. Now, this is true for both digital and physical artifacts, uh, but whereas physical artifacts tends to be perceived as authentic by nature, digital representations maybe somehow needs to be presented as authentic. Uh, and when working with Brock, we have found different way of presenting uh, digital representations of 3D models as authentic. And some of these ways are, for example, showing the origin, showing the provenance of the, th of, of the 3D representations. Another one might be adding a lot of authentic details to, to the 3D models, making it uh, be closer to uh, the origin. And the third one that you can question a little bit if it's if it is about uh, authenticity or, or if, <laughs> if it is really the real thing or, or if it's sort of more in in the um, in something that the visitors experience. But the third one is immersion. That is a good way of making the visitors feel as something is uh, authentic. Yeah, I hope I didn't take too much time, and I hope you. Uh, could hear what I was saying. Thank you. Or oh, it's a two-part question. Uh, first would be, uh, what is uh, the visitor group that you are catering for, and uh, what type of feedback have you had so far with these uh, exhibits that you have uh, have uh, created, and uh, uh, how they have. Uh, have, how have they interpreted the question of authenticity? Yeah, well, I can maybe answer the feedback questions to begin with. And uh, yeah, I think from uh, reading, for example, the um, Google reviews, which is quite a good way of finding out what people who have been to the museum think about it. It's mostly positive, of course. Um, not of course, but I'm very happy to say it, that it's mostly positive. Um, and I think they like, um, some of them of course, um, have commented on the lack of objects. I think with the name as uh, Vrak, the Museum of Rex, and also because it's uh, very close to the Vasa Museum, some people think that it might be a museum where you 
or we display actual wrecks. So I think that it's one of the feedbacks from visitors that have uh, been there, uh, that they might be a little bit disappointed uh, if they expected the actual wrecks. But they are happy to see the digital versions and um, the game, for example, is something that also has been given really good feedback. Uh, so overall, really positive and good reviews from visitors. And we had uh, three different um, segments uh, that were the target groups for the exhibitions, and those were um, uh, adventure, uh, which is uh, people who would like to have new, um, for example, new experience, uh, not uh, previously uh, experienced, for example, digital uh, game and um, such things. Um, and then we had Gemenskap. Um, I'm not sure about that in Sweden. It's uh, <laughs> yes, it's sort of community. yes, community, and it's it's sort of like um, people who want to go to museums to be sort of affirmed. Um, or if you boil it down, uh, people, families, for example, people with, uh, it's not actually targeted at younger children, the exhibitions. Um, but uh, that segment is for uh, visitors who are quite used to go to a lot of museums. Um, so the, I think the aim, the general aim was um, a bit more adventurous uh, visitors not really with small children, but with a little bit older children. And I think the game experience, for example, is uh, very much appreciated. I know also that the museum has been planning on different activities to sort of get the small visitors also into the museum. Yeah, I think something like that. Would you like to add something there, Andreas? No, I think the target groups was good because we, we had three different tar target groups that were quite... Um, very different types of visitors, so we got quite a big variation of the experiences in the museum. Uh, on the second floor we have one exhibition of one out of four that is quite traditional actually, and we do have objects also that we show there and artifacts, uh, because of course that is something people are interested in and they want to see that also. And, but the adventurous people, maybe they want to have more the new technology things and so on. So, uh, we are right to our last presentation in this uh, session. Uh, it will be by Markus Lepola, uh, who is a PhD student at Obo Academy uh, in Turku. And his presentation will focus on the project uh, Svensund 1790 exhibition and uh, will uh, present us the, the, all the solutions uh, and planning processes and uh, also the uh, exhibition itself uh, that was created. So please. So, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Marcus Lepola and uh, I, uh, I work for the uh, Maritime Museum of Finland with this project, uh, exhibit, exhibit project Faithful Svensk Sund or, or Svensk Sund. And I'm currently a PhD student, and I'm also working with another uh, heritage project. So I'm be busy for about a year or more, but I'm hoping that I will be able to return to the, uh, the more of a maritime theme after that. But anyway, so I'm happy to be here to have the chance to tell you about our exhibit at the uh, Maritime Museum of Finland, and we're speaking about uh, Kotka. Uh, and the uh, Maritime Center of Vellamo, which, which is the place where this exhibit is at. So, very dramatic picture. Ooh. Yeah, we'll come to that soon. So, uh, the exhibit uh, opened up two years ago, and we were really lucky that it was in the middle of the corona pandemic. Ooh, lovely. So, <laughs> So we, the, the last uh, months that I worked with this project were in the midst of the big, well, when the corona was happening. So, so we had a little bit of a, we had a little bit of issues to getting this thing uh, brought together due to that. But <clears throat> we, 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 we had the, a good team and we were able to overcome those obstacles. So uh, this is a um, project which was um, possible to, uh, Put through thanks to external financing. So the, I think the total budget for this exhibit was about 800,000 euros. 
and uh, it was uh, divided into three different small like project entities and each of every of these project entities got financing from different channels like we had Google for instance paid for a one part of the exhibit Cordelin Foundation paid for another and uh, Nurmio Foundation paid for uh, a third part of it so so all to, all, all to get, uh, it uh, yeah, it came up to about 800,000 euros. And I started working there in 2018, in the fall. So I was uh, almost two years working with this project. So, the, uh, so what we're looking at is uh, the, uh, the reason why the exhibit is there is because uh, there was a, a big sea battle, or actually we're talking about two sea battles that took place just outside the modern town of Kotka in the sea, in the area which is called Svensk Sund, Swedish Sound, and uh, it was during the war of Gustavus III. So we had one sea battle between Sweden and Russia, which took part, in, which, which was in 1789, which Sweden lost, and then the second one uh, in 1790, uh, 9th of July. And that was uh, is considered the largest sea battle in the history of the Baltic. So we have uh, we had 214 Swedish vessels and about 170 Russian vessels that were fighting each other on that day. And uh, uh, there were about 12,000 Russian troops on board these Russian vessels and around 10,000 Swedish. So, so the Swedes had more ships but lesser crews. And as a result of these sea battles, uh, we uh, have uh, the whole area where this, this battle took place is uh, declared as a national heritage site. So no diving is allowed without proper, uh, proper licensing. And uh, as part of this uh, whole project was the fact that this is like a grand event, you know, war, violence, blood, all that stuff. So we wanted to bring this down to a more personal level. Uh, we, will, we had a, uh, when we're looking at this exhibit, we had an exhibit like an architect design firm who designed the, uh, the concept of the exhibit. And uh, we also had a, uh, testing, we had also, also had a, a perspective of w what type of uh, people we would we would direct the exhibit for, and we had like children was one group, we had uh, casual visitors as one group, and then we also had the, uh, let's say, the uh, history buffs as a third group, which were uh, trying to, to, to fit the exhibit to. And I think we got a pretty good uh, hol hol holistic project, pro hol got a pre pretty good uh, exhibit, so I think it's, there's something for everyone. And uh, as part of this, we had a lot of research done because um, when it comes to you know exhibiting things with modern technological solutions, you always have to do the proper background work, research work, and it's really impressive how detailed you can get when you start researching. Like for instance, you see the uh, this painting here is by uh, the Swedish uh, artist Schultz. Who, who, who painted a few paintings, dramatic paintings uh, of these sea battles, and you see the big explosion in the front there with a lot of people flying up. Uh, we actually know the names of some of those guys flying in the air, so, for instance, and it's a Swedish gun sloop, and the reason why it exploded was because the, the crew was uh, not handling their uh, uh, source of fire correctly. They dumped uh, some fuse into a powder keg and whoops, it went up. So it wasn't not due to Russian shelling, it was a uh, uh, you know, mistake by the crew itself. And, but anyhow, so we divided the exhibit into three teams. So we have the battles, the wrecks, and the fort. So I don't have a map of the exhibit hall as such, but uh, uh, the, when you enter the exhibit, you will first step into the part with the wrecks. And uh, 
this part is left really, um, the whole idea of this uh, first part is to immerse the visitor into the, the underworld, no, the, not the underworld, the under, underwater, undersurface world, that they're under this water surface and kind of experiencing the, the, the cold, cold waters of Svensk Sund. And um, when you look back at the really like the history of the exhibit itself, we, we go back really far like the, the, you see the elements in the center of this uh, exhibit halls. They are pieces of a Russian uh, ship, Russian frigate, St. Nikolai, which one of the more, more, most, uh, well, that's one of the uh, uh, most famous wrecks of Svensk Sund. And uh, it was discovered in 1940s because it's in the middle of the current shipping lane, more or less. And uh, they actually had to, uh, I remember, saw off the, the saw off some uh, the, the masts of the ship because it's about a, it's uh, about 20 meters under the surface, and, and and it was a risk for shipping. Well, uh, and during the 50s and 60s, especially, there was a lot of amateur dive history and divers visiting the wreck, and and and, and they had the, and they started pulling out. You know parts of the wreck, so you know well, maybe one fifth of the wreck was actually taken above surface and uh, deposited at the uh, Varissari or Krok urn. And there was a vision maybe that they that there would be a big museum about the battle, and the museum would be essentially the wreck Saint Nikolai, which would be completely salvaged and, and, and much like the Vasa would be like that. It would be like the centerpiece of the museum, but, but that just didn't happen. It was just too big and, and, and it was, you know. So there was really no, no planning, no, no, it just, it was just, in, it just happened and suddenly you have a big pile of wood, wooden Legos that you can't really do anything with. But in this exhibit we, we used the, some parts of the wreck and we made this installation. So it's an installation that it's not supposed to look, it's not, they're, they're, it's not supposed to look like a genuine wreck. It's just to, to show some pieces of it. But the figurehead, that's the figurehead from the Sankt Nikolai itself. So uh, you can see, um, uh, we already went through that. We, in front of the wreck, there's a there's a, a wall, an interactive wall, that is that we have projection, uh, and the, uh, as of a, there's a projection of the 3D model of the Saint Nikolai. As part of my project, we were able to finance a diver to do uh, uh, 3D scans of four known wrecks in the Svensk Sund area and. Saint Nikolai was the biggest and the most difficult one to do a 3D scan on, and uh, we used that 3D scan of Saint Nikolai to create a uh, experience for uh, younger visitors. That is, that the younger visitors are able to to dive into this uh, wreck and 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 find and find uh, objects, just as uh, a, a diver would do. And, and it's actually a pike fish, you can see it. It's a pike fish which is swimming around and, 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 and you are able to, to, to go to different spartans by touching the wall. This wall is just like a plywood wall. There's no canvas, it's just a plywood wall painted. And it's, there, there, there are like copper plates on the back side of it which, which react to touch. So you touch the plywood wall and the copper plates will be able to read that touching. And, uh, and it's really practical because if it gets dirty, you can wash it, and if it gets more dirty, you can paint it again. So, so that's just the practicality of it. We did consider using like these 3D goggles in this exhibit, but we went, we didn't go for it because uh, it just had too many technical issues, and it was also difficult if you have a larger group of people coming that, like with children, having them queuing, maybe having three few goggles and they're queuing. No. It's not going to work, but now this actually works well with kids. So we can have a group of kids uh, experiencing this together. 
sitting on the floor. So it's been a really, it, it's, it has had a really, it has worked on a practical level. And here are some of the objects that they're able to, to salvage from the ship. All of these, uh, we have an array of objects that actually derived from the St. Nikolai, which had been 3D modeled, scanned, and those are inside the wreck, so you can find them in there while they're diving. And like a comb, and there's a shoe that belonged to one of the poor Russian, Russian uh, uh, crew members that drowned, and there's also a small icon of I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like a small pocket icon which you bring along. It's just, it's almost like a tobacco package. It's not bigger than a small, yeah, like a pack of smokes. And in this hall, we also have a very traditional way of showing uh, the wrecks. Uh, here is, uh, there are a few screens that you can use, and by just pointing on the different wrecks, you can. Uh, Either you get an image of it and some text, or you can get a 3D image of the of the uh, the wreck itself. Like here's one of the uh, one of the wrecks that was 3D scanned for this project. And as a researcher, when they're researching wrecks and trying to identify them, using this 3D modeling is really a good way of of, of being able to identify different wrecks when you're able to. You know, sit back from a computer screen and look at some details and then like, okay, and, and compare it to the historical material and realize, oh yeah, this is probably that Slobnaya and so on. So, um, when we went, this part is about the battle itself and, and in this part we also pulled out in, like um, personal narratives, like people, individuals that took part in this uh, battle and how, how they perceived it. So we, uh, we, thanks to the research we were able to do, we were able to pull out real personal narratives and present the battle from that perspective. And there's, you know, we have, and the, and the, we dressed some models. This is actually an Estonian company that photographed them. So there are Estonian models <laughs> presented in this exhibit. And, but, the, but he, like the one to the left there, he's supposed to be from Holland. He's called Johan Frum, who's a boatsman. On, he was on board Stubjörn, one of the Swedish vessels. Like, um, here's uh, just to show you that, that uh, it's all new and modern and bling bling and stuff like that. But, you know, you always have to keep in in my opinion, when you're making like a modern exhibit and using new technologies, you, you have to keep in mind that you're a museum, you're not a theme park. A theme park, uh, if, you, if it feels more too much of a theme park, then you're doing something wrong. There always has to be the historical content, there has to be the real research, the real background material has to be there. So the media, the modern media is only a way of, 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 of kind of enhancing a story, which is there, but you still have to do the research. And just for an interest, like there's a name there. Let's see where is up there, Petter Hagberg. That's actually not Petter. That's Brita. That's a girl. Her husband, Petter Hagberg, uh, is a real person. And, and, and according to the story, Petter and Brita were married, lived in Stockholm. And when Petter went out to sea in 1789 to fight in this war, she was keen to join him and, and, and was able to pose as a man and become a crew member on board the frigate Sturbjörn. Interesting, yeah. So there are lots of, but uh, Brita did not, she, her history was not, we weren't able to take all these personal histories into account. We m m just were able to select like a third of all these individual stories we had. So she is not in there, but we have another woman called Anna Engberg, who is, uh, sorry, Engström, Engsten, who was included in it. And, uh, here, here's just an image of the, the battle gallery here. And then, like, uh, one of the bigger, uh, uh, bigger visual effects we made was uh, we did a 3D, or actually it's a, there's a cave theater inside this part of the gallery, a cave theater. So you are walking into a gallery, or a theater which is like an eggshell on the inside. And there's a projection going, it's about 10 minutes long. 
so you can take part of the battle and experience it. And it's almost as good as it gets without the 3D goggles. So there are like 10, 15 people are able to experience this at one time. And now I'm just going to see if this does work or not. We'll see. If it doesn't, I'm just keep ahead, and you'll be able to look at this at YouTube. But this is just a preview of how it, it works. The, uh, are you going to pull it up, or am I going to press it? OK. It didn't explode. OK, I'm just going to. slide and I'll be able to oh no I see that's not so okay we're so uh, at last part of the exhibit is the uh, uh, is, it has to do with the city of the town of Kotka and the fortress which was built after the battle by the Russians. They fortified the whole place because they didn't want to have a third battle as Svensk, especially after losing the second one. So, uh, and this has a lot to do with the history of the town Kotka. And you can see in the middle there is this, this is the third, uh, uh, third uh, new modern technological element we uh, uh, applied to the uh, to exhibit. And it's a 3D model of the city, the, the islands on which the Kotka, the city of Kotka is now, and, 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 and you can like experience how it evolved into the town today. So you can go through this different stage of the building of the great fortress, which is still evident in the town today. You can see it in the ruins, but, but this is how it, you can get like a, a historical cut of what, what happened there. And here's uh, more visions of the town life in the city of, uh, of the Kotka in the early 19th century during Russian era. So we combined a lot of traditional elements but also new technologies and I think that is a very fresh look at uh, how, how to build functioning interesting exhibits and, and let's say for all the research we did there are lots of details to be discussed, but I guess like maybe one, one sixth of what we discovered was actually we were able to use in the exhibit. So, so, so the exhibit is always like a very thin slice of the whole cheese. You, so, you, so, so in that case an exhibit can never tell the whole story. You just choose which elements you want to portray and tell. So, and this was our interpretation of it. And uh, thank you very much. And I was just curious, did you look at any Russian sources as regards to the historical record, and uh, specifically if you want to comment 
on the um, like the foreign officers that might have been in the Russian uh, Navy employed from the West at that time? I don't know if you. Um, we there's some this it, it would be a whole different story if I went to details about it. But we had a uh, during the part of this research work was done in, in, in as a joint operation and cooperation with Russian museums. We had three Russian museums and, and, and colleagues, Russian colleagues who were part of this process. And we built some good, good contacts there. Uh, sadly, it's a bit difficult to work with them now due to events. So, so yes, we had a lot of cooperation with Russians, especially Vyborg Museum and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the Artillery Museum in St. Petersburg. And uh, furthermore, yes, a lot of the uh, uh, Russian ships were commanded by foreign, uh, foreign officers, like the Saint Nikolai was, was actually, uh, I think his name was Marshall, who was the, uh, the captain of the vessel, I think, and he, he died. And it was actually a reason why the ship was sunk to begin with, because he didn't want to strike, struck the, strike the colors. He wanted to fight to the bitter end. And his crew said, "No, let's give up." <laughs> so, so there are there were a lot of so we we have, but we choose not to take these uh, persons in. Well, Marshall is actually part of the exhibit. You can see him there. He is, he's presented as one of the person people with a personal narrative. So, but if you want, we can discuss this later in more detail because there's lots of details, and I think most people are hungry now. <laughs> yeah. <Just Cool>. uh, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, yeah, a very, very quick one, hopefully. Uh, and, and a question out of curiosity. We met when uh, you were starting uh, uh, in the initial part of your research project. Was the research project uh, like formated as a result uh, of that you were going to do an exhibition, or was it a research project that led to an exhibition? The research project was geared to an exhibit, yeah. We wanted to see through the resources, because, uh, and, and we realized that lots of things in the sources was not really 100%. And uh, furthermore, there was also the issue of, of the fact being quite sense, this whole thing being quite sensitive for Russians. For some reason, they don't like losing battles. Well, you know, it was, we never wanted to get this, like to be a big question about who won, who lost. We wanted just to show, the complexity of war and how, how it affects people and, and how individuals like experience this type of conflict. So we want to bring it down to a like a normal level, like the victim level. And we didn't want to like point fingers and things like that. But the Russians initially had problems with it. They were like, why are you doing this? This, this is something that we would rather like to forget. We said, no, it's, you know, war is war. You know? People die, everybody loses, so. But we wanted also to initiate them in order to find that they, they had a role in this exhibit so that we weren't making like a thing, a monument of Finnish Swedish victory versus Russian loss. So that was also, it was like a political move as well because this is a history that involves three different countries at least. And, and we wanted to, 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 to extend that to Russia and Sweden as well giving them opportunity to have a, have a say in this exhibit. And they had a say, and they were happy with it. So, uh, thank you, Marcus. You. Speaker, I want to uh, welcome up to the stage is uh, PhD Minna Koiviko. Uh, Minna is an archaeologist, been working with archaeology for a very long time, and uh, was one of the first scientific divers in Finland. Uh, her research has uh, mainly focused on a site, Somenlinna, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Finland, where, uh, and she also did her PhD on that topic and is now involved in a project uh, at, that we have heard, or a program that we have heard about before today, the Lost Navy. And uh, uh, Mina's project uh, is called the End of Glory Days. And uh, as part of this project, you have uh, been doing a lot of field work and so on in Somalina, and also a lot of communication and popularization. And that you will tell us more about now. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. It's very good to be here. 
my colleagues were here about a month ago. They came with an, with an old steamship and I missed that. So I was like uh, thinking that this one I'm not going to miss. Um, yeah, Anna mentioned about the UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's always also a UNESCO convention. And I think that we have uh, kind of uh, suffered that uh, in, in the underwater archaeology because it says that the correct location for things are uh, underwater in situ. And uh, previously we were living in the period that uh, everything was supposed to be brought up. So uh, is it now that, that we are not supposed to bring anything up or is it something that we still can do? And here in my front page you can see very happy pictures from last summer in excavation at Suomenlinna and there is actually a front axle of a gun carriage and there's a ship specialist and dendro specialist and a maritime archaeologist and our, our technical uh, asset uh, smiling uh, in, in these images and you can see that we are using all senses, color is smelling of the oak and uh, dendro specialist Thomas Argala is very happy of having a good sample. It's not very easy task to have. But anyways, uh, this is a kind of a lot of like me, me talk because uh, I've been thinking that what, what a scientific diver um, can contribute uh, to this, uh, uh, this uh, task so that uh, we could engage public more uh, into, into discovering uh, our special sites. And uh, yeah, I have, uh, actually I think I already have like 30 years of experience, but this years go so, quickly when you are doing something you are very motivated and, and you love. And uh, as uh, already mentioned, uh, this is the 18th century fortress Suomenlinna. So greetings to Suomenlinna, that is also my home islands. There are about 850 residents. I don't know them all, but uh, quite many of them and uh, about a million visitors in a year. So that is uh, a great challenge how you can uh, talk about the underwater part of the fortress uh, because uh, there are so many different people and different interests. When we were walking back uh, from the lunch, we went to see uh, the cog find uh, Estonian colleagues have just recently discovered. It was really impressive. And uh, I realized that uh, I don't have any pictures of Suomenlin now where you can have the fortress. So I only now have the white spots uh, which, which, are, which are the fortress uh, on land, and I'm presenting the underwater part. And th that is normally the challenge because people have so much on land, so and they don't have the access to see uh, what is underwater. So here is a very old, very old uh, multi-beam uh, sonar uh, scanning from the uh, sea area of Suomenlinna, and uh, in a couple of years ago. Uh, Metropolia Ale Torkal was uh, producing, uh, he, he tried to see what kind of 3D can be uh, done in this material which is already like over 10 years, 10 years old. So the resolution is now much more better if you go and scan the water area. My personal challenge is that uh, uh, for me the main, main motivation is that I try to make people realize the importance of the relationship with water, you know, because we are, as we know, we are mainly water and the water cycle connects us all. So, so I think that uh, uh, that is something I, I want to make people realize that they have the uh, relationship with water and, and, and then the connection, but that quite many uh, people are afraid of the sea and, and there is a lot of unseen fear. So, so I think that this is uh, uh, something very personal, but it, it's good if I can you know, push people into that direction to start to think about it. And this image uh, is from our excavation last summer uh, at Suomenlinna, so that our research vessel is approaching the site and our rib is alre already there uh, taking the mooring uh, lines. Over 10 years ago, we had this um, bubbling under the underwater cultural heritage of Suomenlinna, uh, this kind of a temporary exhibition at, at Suomalina Museum and, and it was really nice because then we could combine the LiDAR material uh, into this underwater part and people could, you know, go with a 3D mouse uh, and, and uh, travel 
travel also to the underwater landscape and, and it was for the first time made visual and uh, it had effect on the people and their relationship with the sea area, at least uh, <laughs> I hope so. And uh, because there are a lot of fears and, uh, and we have this uh, traditional water spirit uh, which, we're, which we used uh, as a guide for the, for the exhibition and uh, the feedback from the audience was quite uh, impressive because quite many were uh, scared as a child with the water spirit to, to keep away from the water to, you know, to uh, drown him basically. So it was quite emotional. And uh, uh, just uh, about a month ago, uh, another exhibition was ended. There I just had a very small role. Uh, and uh, together with my, my friend Magdalena, uh, we established this kind of a, a little uh, uh, little show with the diving gear we, which we were using under ice and we were cooperating with a local school. The school made uh, from, from old uh, sea charts, uh, made uh, this uh, archipelago fleet and it was presented at the, at the museum and then we had an event where we uh, let p uh, children dress as divers and, and it was a lot of fun, uh, I hope that it was fun for them too. But anyways, uh, the problem is that how to make it easily accessible and visual. Uh, this water spirit Nake, uh, because the temporary exhibition is <laughs> gone for a very long time ago, but Nake continues uh, living in the children's book and uh, people, well, we always look underwater with our mind's eye. If we don't have any information, any, any images, we don't, it's like a white paper. Uh, but uh, if we have the information, then we can see what is under underneath. For example, uh, this uh, uh, quick uh, large uh, embankment, which is made out of wood. Uh, if you can imagine a log house, which is 100 meters long and 10 meters wide, it is there underwater. And we had a 100 years anniversary uh, for the site. So not only this kind of huge constructions uh, there is also uh, very famous uh, wreck sites. For example, this uh, ship of the line, Kronprinz Gustav Adolf, which has over 70 cannons. Uh, we uh, established this kind of uh, underwater trail already uh, at the year 2000, and it's been very popular among divers. And uh, finally, we managed to have, as part of the Baltzar project, which uh, we were cooperating with uh, Estonia and Sweden, we, we managed to have this uh, land sign uh, at Somalina where you can actually see the wreck site and the story is told. I think that was a very, very positive thing. So, towards meaningful work. There are a lot of, uh, during my career, the world has changed a lot, so there are a lot of new opportunities how we can uh, how we can uh, t tell the stories ourselves for a bigger audience. For example, for six years we have wrote a blog, we have uh, been active in Facebook, uh, and uh, as well now we have more concentrated on Instagram. And, and uh, it's, uh, it also makes the uh, actual work more meaningful when you can, can share the joy we have while we are doing the work. And it's not only about the sharing, it's all, you always have to have the content, as uh, Marcus pointed out, about the research. So uh, for me, it was like that we first had the exhibition and then I could concentrate. Well, first we had the survey, then the exhibition, and then I started to do my PhD. Because when you are studying something, it takes time, it's slow. So if you have the urge of giving a new information once a week or once a month, uh, it's quite impossible uh, with this kind of new research. You just have to dig something, you just raise up. Uh, like uh, I think in Vrak Museum you are doing excellent work. For example, you have the month of the wreck. So I, I think it's a very good concept. So uh, also this kind of uh, uh, building up a, a community of divers and, and uh, people who are interested in maritime archaeology in Finland, there's a very active maritime archaeological society, and we have a good cooperation with them. And um, yes, I'm actually one of the grounding members of the society, so it's, it's very good that it's uh, now more alive than ever. And uh, yeah, it's good to have all sort of different events 
for example, one big event we had together with the society and, and the University of Helsinki was ICOVA 7, so the biggest maritime archaeological uh, congress uh, in this planet, if I could say. Well, we had like 200 visitors from 33 different countries, so I think it was a quite, uh, well, it was a big event. So, uh, your attitude is, is quite important, so if, if you are asked to give a presentation, uh, wrote a press release, or be a visitor in podcast, or radio program, or TV program, it's very good if you always try to say yes, because uh, uh, then you, you are getting uh, audience which don't normally uh, find the path uh, for underwater things, so, so basically uh, it's, it's always good if you have the approach that this is an opportunity to share the information. And because we are always uh, suffering from the lack of funding, so I don't think that we can have like this one big solution for this issue. It's just a question of direction. So you have the direction, choose where you're aiming at with your work, and in the long run, the small steps count. So, uh, when I sent the abstract, my question is that, that was what is the expected contribution of a scientific diver? And can we uh, finally accept it as an important part of our profession? Well, it is very difficult because you still, uh, in your soul, you think that you should be doing the research and you're not supposed to put so much effort on, on the PR stuff. So I think the concept you have created in Sweden is, is like a really good, really good because you have all the support uh, to bring up the information. So congratulate. And um, very shortly the idea now I am uh, struggling with is the study site uh, and, uh, and the archipelago fleet uh, in a historical moment in 1808 uh, there was a uh, Russian was uh, conquering the, the fortress and there was only uh, oh, over 100 vessels which were left behind and, uh, and some of those wrecks have uh, found their last resting position in the area of Suomenlinna, so I'm concentrating on, on those wooden wrecks and uh, yeah, it was a process of peace, so I think uh, big and difficult and up-to-date question of creating peace is, uh, is something which also can be raised uh, within this research. And uh, how do you tell the stories and what stories you are supposed to tell? Those are always very good questions. So uh, for me, uh, I think that people love people. So we have all this uh, technical things. I think those are super super nice and I really li like the photogrammetric models because there is some sort of a uh, sense of a, uh, sense of a diving or, or sense of a kind of a poet poetic sense for example in, in the Ralf Museum. It, it's really really good but then uh, I think uh, people love people so when you have the live people telling about the stories then, then it's, it's really good. So for example, my colleague Rick Alvik, who is now working with her PhD at uh, one of our famous wrecks, Frau Maria, which is presented at the Wrak Museum, so she is giving presentation today there. Otherwise, she would be here. Uh, we had the excavation camp, and we uh, we reserved some time because we were close to the Helsinki, so this uh, fortress is just in 15 minutes ferry, ferry trip away from the city center. So we had the whole morning for the, for the press and, and the media, and then in the afternoon we were taking people uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the fortress to visit our site, and we could explain how we are collecting the, the material from, from the seabed, from the wrecks, and, and people really li liked that. One imp important thing is that uh, 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 the head of the governing body of Suomenlinna, which is under the Ministry of Culture. So I uh, encourage their leader, Ilari Kurri, to come and dive on one of the wrecks. And, and uh, he took the challenge and, and uh, came to visit the wreck site. So I think that if we can uh, push or 
encourage the people who are in, in uh, good positions to make decisions. So I, I think that is a, it's a very good way to um, raise the awareness of, of the underwater part. So uh, this project uh, it is really cooperation with Sweden and it's uh, uh, funded mainly from, from Riksbankens and uh, Jubileumsfond and then uh, uh, Finnish Heritage Agency and, and two different foundations uh, from, from Finland are, are funding uh, the field works and, and, uh, and the diving part. So there are quite many wrecks here. You can see, see the dots and, and their codes. And here are a few photos uh, from Mikko Voipio uh, taking uh, from our excavation last, last summer. And this is the other wreck site we were, we were uh, studying actually uh, what day is today. Yeah, on Monday uh, we were diving there and, and installing uh, data loggers because uh, we have a marine biologist uh, researching the, the water or the temperature uh, around the wooden wreck so that uh, there probably is this sort of kind of a uh, shield uh, which, which has a higher temperature uh, around the wreck. It's, it's kind of a uh, composing, is it compost? Composting, yes, composting phenomena. And we are studying now that. Uh, and that relates, of course, the big question of climate crisis. So it's, it's very good to do these small steps, uh, but still have the big questions. And what about the visions for the future? Mm -hmm. Should we have more information science or maritime objects on land? Because uh, when they are underwater, we, we don't really like, see them. So these anchors in public places, they are, they are really good remind, reminders of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ships and wrecks. And could we have this kind of mobile trail with, uh, uh, with uh, what is our error? It's the augmented reality, yes. So, uh, and then I think we should have more information in the permanent exhibition at Suomalina Museum. And, and make a tradition of this yearly event for diving. That could be a very good way of, of building a good community. And uh, uh, this excavation, yes, now we try to try to see if we can continue. The problem is that this is an old military area, so we managed to find some sort of uh, dangerous chemicals. And yesterday morning, I was with with the police going through our excavation finds that if there is still uh, some dangerous material which they need to you know take into closer analysis so i don't know if it if we can really go on with the excavation at somalina but anyways we can uh, do the photogrammetry and uh, and the dendro sampling and because so uh, we are quite in the north we have quite many years their ice coverage so i don't know if we could use that one too, so that could be really exotic for foreign visitors. So uh, in the beginning, uh, there was the uh, front axle from the cannon carriage. There is the cannon and then there's the rest of the carriage. So we did the sampling and when we returned the axle uh, to the site, and that is something, the way we can bring things up without uh, uh, committing to to process of conservation and, and uh, and storage uh, for a longer period. I think uh, that's about it. There I am swimming with the fish. I hope to do it for a long time. Thank you. Uh, my question is, do you have any kind of statistics, uh, for example, about how many divers visit this park, let's say yearly or monthly or whatever? And uh, there's a second part as well, wait for it. Mm -hmm. And if you have, have you noticed, for example, uh, any changes in these numbers when you supply new information about this uh, site to the public or something like this? Does this, uh, like getting out that information, has that affected these visits anyway? anyway? Two very difficult questions. Yes, we thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so we have a visitor's book, so people li like to you know, sign in, so we, we can't uh, count the signs. So that, that's the way we, we can uh, track the number of visitors. But I don't have the numbers here, so and I'm not going to guess them. But we can come back to that. And uh, I don't know, uh, because we haven't really been able to uh, 
to make more research because when we opened it, we, we made a Salamare and wrote a really good article about it. And in, during the Baltasar project, I think uh, there was already a new generation of divers. So, so perhaps, perhaps it does. Mm. It would be interesting to know. So that would be yeah. that if, 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 if like getting that information out, mm. does it affect the visits and stuff like that? So yeah. whenever you have a chance, then maybe you should monitor that as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a good point because we can do it uh, because it's, it's a Swedish vessel. So, so we can do it uh, during this project. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for the interesting presentation. When you talked, I remembered that the first time when the Estonian Maritime Museum went to Finland, met with colleagues from your Maritime Museum, um, at that time, it was in the 80s, and uh, the first place where we were visited after visiting the museum was Suomenlinna. Mm. And uh, mm, it's and we didn't know anything about the waters, the rich waters around it. It's so interesting that the some place that it's familiar for centuries. And uh, now this underwater world. Uh, what about uh, the mm, uh, dock? I remember there was still is. In what condition it is? And it's the, do you involve it also somehow in the projects? The, the dry dock, it's still functional. But of course, it, it um, needs maintenance all the time. And there should be more resources to maintain it so that it can be actively used uh, for next decade too, yeah. And I'm very happy that you remember the visit to Suomenlinna and to the Maritime Museum. We were then in, in, in Hylgusar. Thank you, Mila. Thank you. And the next uh, person we, we are welcoming to the stage is Sean T. Rickard. Sean is a maritime historian and researcher. He is a companion of the, Na uh, of the Naval Order of the United States, member of the Irish Forum and member of the Nautical Research Society. And uh, your main interest uh, in research is uh, Irish maritime and US naval history, pr uh, particularly privateering during the American War of Independence and Irish maritime history of the 18th century. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tanan teid vaga ku lalis la kuse ya sure mel suse este. Ludan et halda sin seda oigesti jumal tanta tud et si conferens in inglesi kelis niete e pia kulama ku, ku quides ma tie kaunus e ma kelt ristilun. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I would like to say that I'm very grateful to Dr. Uh, Hila Kiman and the Estonian Maritime Museum for, for your very kind invitation. Um, I also appreciate much of the opportunity to present some of uh, the work in this historic place. Um, I'm also grateful to Isabella Glushauskaite um, for her very kind uh, assistance in facilitating the same. I hope that the exchange of ideas will lead to greater cooperation and friendship between our two nations in exploring our unique maritime heritage and culture. Indeed, I hope it lends to preserving our shared maritime heritage and culture for future generations to interpret. Um, the paper um, will largely focus on Ireland's cultural heritage uh, components, particularly the tangible material elements uh, of our unique maritime heritage. Uh, and the work being done to explore, retrieve, and present it. it might, I might add that uh, while I am a member of several maritime organizations, the ideas presented here are my own. Uh, I will start with sharing some geographical facts uh, related to Ireland and Estonia. Estonia has an approximate coastline of 3,790 kilometers. In contrast, Ireland has approximately uh, 7,524, or it's roughly twice the size of Estonia. The, the great disparity regarding the number of known shipwrecks between the country is not so much accounted for the geographic size difference between the two nations, but more so that Ireland's territory, territorial waters fall within uh, most of the major sea routes of, to Northern Europe. 
Ireland, in contrast, being an island, it is naturally totally exposed to the sea. No place in Ireland is more than 80 kilometers away from the sea, located in the North Atlantic Ocean. This fact helps account for the great difference of number of shipwrecks off our coast. There is a known 15,000 plus shipwrecks in the territorial seas around Ireland. Some estimates go as far as 18,000 shipwrecks. The proximity of the great deal of maritime traffic going to ports in Europe passes by or near Ireland was a fact highlighted and made, um, made uh, very um, evident in the naval strategies of the two uh, major wars in the 20th century and indeed critical to their outcomes. Um, the two battles of the Atlantic were largely fought off the coasts of Ireland. Also, the island of Ireland is physically next to and adjacent to many of the major historic maritime powers. These include Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, parts of Scandinavia and the territories and uh, by extension Holland, Belgium, Germany, if not including nations uh, that border the Western Mediterranean and indeed the North, uh, North Africa. The historic maritime trade associated with these great maritime nations uh, operating in and near the seas around, sea routes around Ireland have obviously led to a great number of shipwrecks deposited within what is now considered and internationally recognized as Irish territorial waters. A great number of shipwrecks also occurred over a millennia in Ireland's trade with Britain. So uh, in essence, the exact geographic location of Ireland has been a leading factor in the location of shipwrecks within our waters. Another major contribution to the number of shipwrecks is ultimately from the predominant weather systems and particularly wind patterns around Ireland. Innumerable fronts and storms which largely emanate from the Western Hemisphere generally travel from west to east gathering momentum over the Atlantic Ocean as they travel eastward. In the days of sail, these fronts blew uh, many a ship to peril on the leeward shore of Ireland and these weather systems crossed over as they passed you know, as they passed Ireland. Um, this added to the hydrographic features of the Irish Sea, also caused astronomical number of shipwrecks. The fetch of the sea, that's the shallowness uh, caused in effects with the water, uh, of the Irish Sea to the eastern half of Ireland, along with the treacherous offshore sandbanks, and indeed the strong sea currents caused by the bottlenecked land at the entrance of the North Passage to the northeast of Ireland, to the northeast of Ireland and west of mainland Britain and the St. George's Channel marking the, sh the southeast of Ireland and the southwest of Britain have led to a great deal of shipwrecks occurring in these regions. Historically, these regions have been um, perilous for sailing ships just making landfall um, on the continent of Europe, but particularly those um, making landfall off Ireland, Britain and France. This is particularly poignant in the days uh, before substantial improvement in navigation and marine propulsion. Um, as compared with more insulated um, Estonia in the Eastern Baltic, it's easy to see the, the stark contrast uh, uh, and the heavy multinational maritime traffic and uh, transatlantic storm systems, which have contributed immensely to the number of shipwrecks off Ireland as opposed to Estonia. However, this, this, this quantity difference does not necessarily equate to any greater custody of maritime heritage or indeed to a lesser evaluation of maritime history and culture. Ireland indubitably has a very poor track record when it comes to maritime thinking and its myriad of forms within its own country from um, traditional national security uh, issues, historic transportation issues, its fisheries, to the preservation of maritime heritage and culture are but some examples where Ireland has failed in the past miserably uh, to meet its maritime potential. However, all the causes may not be justifiably her own fault. Indeed, if, if, if it is the case, Ireland yet remains uh, as a great potential as this lethargic maritime um, philosophy is slowly fading away through education and enthusiasm. Great bounds by several organizations, individuals have paved the way for a more um, uh, enlightened maritime future for Ireland. The Republic of Ireland presently claims dominion over a seabed in the North Atlantic of 220 million acres or uh, 880,000 uh, 880, kilometers squared. 
where, which is 10 times the terrestrial size of the island of Ireland, or roughly the size of modern Germany. If uh, one considers this alone, it makes um, the geography, geographic size of Ireland as one of the largest countries in Europe. Um, it's kind of funny when I hear that from the perspective of Ireland. Um, in these waters alone, among are the various natural sources in the Bentis, in the seas, the elements. And I repeat, there are, there are known 15,000 uh, shipwrecks. Um, there is uh, approximately one shipwreck for every 45 square kilometers of, of territorial land or Benthas uh, in Ireland. A thousand plus shipwrecks occurred in the Irish territorial waters during World War I. A great many of these shipwrecks have not been professionally explored, while others have been explored or haven't been explored to their full potential uh, in yielding maritime artifacts for the collection and preservation. This would provide an even greater uh, potential uh, maritime heritage for Ireland, Europe, and the world. This is an incredible untapped resource, not only for Ireland and Irish maritime heritage, but for the world's maritime heritage. Some of the most highlighted um, and studied wrecks by the Irish government are those that directly affected Irish history. It includes such wrecks as the RMS Lusitania, the RMS Leinster, the Eli Morocco, which is the ex-British um, vessel HMS Helga, uh, and of course the various shipwrecks from the Spanish Armada of 1588. These are all located within Irish territorial waters. The exploration of these wrecks alone has not only revealed a wealth of historical facts that has immediately, uh, immensely affected the revised interpretation of their narratives, it has also used, yielded some very important art artifacts of the error. The advent of recent financial prosperity in Ireland within the last generation, coupled with the revitalized interest from various segments of government, along with sincere public and private endeavors, has led to several advances to the importance of preserving maritime heritage and culture in Ireland. However, it should be noted that many of these directive incentives and indeed guidance uh, have come from a more financially secure Europe. Until the National Monument Act of 1987, which introduced legislation to protect Ireland's maritime uh, heritage and culture, little if anything had been done for over 100 years. These policies now have not always stopped the theft of, of, of artifacts from shipwrecks. According to Fair Seas, a new ENGO watch group, only 2.1% of our ocean is protected in Ireland. This group wants to build a movement of responsible ocean stewardship uh, to 30% by 2030. It has been sorely needed for many years. The problem is not just with maritime heritage, but it includes habitat destruction, aquatic pollution, overfishing, national security, and the social erosion of maritime communities are but some to mention some of the more serious maritime concerns for Ireland. In regards to maritime heritage, the law is now very clear the responsibilities of retrieving objects from wrecks by divers. Historically, little accountability had been afforded until recently by any govern Irish government agency regarding maritime heritage and culture, but this is changing fast. Uh, with the addition of European incentives through various European-funded programs, Ireland has not only ratified uh, Grenada, uh, but the uh, Valletta Conventions of 19, in, in 1997 to further protect uh, maritime heritage. But as it has also begun a very detailed survey of intercoastal waters for not only assessing the amount of potential material of maritime heritage that may be available uh, is one of the objects of these surveys. It must be said, since the advent of uh, recreational divers in the 1960s, several wrecks around our coast, many of them considered war graves, have been pillaged by unscrupulous divers. Indubitably, um, several undocumented maritime artifacts had been stolen from shipwrecks and often ended up on the black market or kept as personal trophies. Um, but it, it behoves uh, the, uh, the bodies of government for protection of the environment and seas and maritime heritage to up their game as such. Uh, it also behoves government to ensure that these uh, enforcement agencies need to be better funded, manned, equipped, equipped and 
to develop new strategies of protection um, in, in order to properly execute their duties. Part of the effective policy is constant vigilance, not only of the, a maritime activity, but conducting um, a continual uh, surveillance of the aquatic environment and its important wreck sites. An important Irish governmental department for the sake of our discussion today is the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications. Several subject, subsections of this government department, such as Forest Namara, um, Maritime uh, in, Marine Institute, excuse me, um, are responsible for marine research, technology development and innovation in Ireland and have led the way to more enlightened thinking on how Ireland considers the sea. Um, it might, however, improve on its humanity sector. Uh, the body that oversees uh, Inframar, which is the government body responsible for charting uh, of the Bentis in Irish territorial waters, um, as one can imagine, this project has begun only a, some years ago, has achieved great success in such a small period. However, it's an ongoing project and there is still much work to do. And while the latter organisation is largely essentially a mapping agency, it has provided and continues to provide and improve detailed charts, maps, surveys of the seas around Ireland on which critical maritime policy is made. Obviously, this includes the charting of all shipwrecks in and around Ireland uh, encountered in these surveys. It has become a very important tool not only for the initial assessment of tangible objects of Irish maritime heritage and culture, but how uh, those environments change. Another important Irish governmental department uh, to our discussion is the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, formerly known as the State, of the, the, um, State for Heritage and Electoral uh, Reform. This department oversees the National Monument Service, which in turn oversees the Irish uh, Underwater Archaeological Unit. This, is, this small unit is technically the Irish government's body that documents and surveys all important archaeological shipwrecks and sub-aquatic uh, uh, structures for the Republic of Ireland. It not only documents historic shipwrecks and archaeological structures found in the sea, but also those found in and around Ireland's many lakes and rivers. This small group have been extremely active in uh, only, uh, not only recording uh, several shipwrecks of archaeological importance, um, which is basically any shipwreck over 100 years old uh, falls within the jurisdiction of the Irish government, but they have published extensively on their findings. The Heritage Council of Ireland is a, a, a critically uh, important Irish body that promotes preservation, um, among other things, maritime heritage and culture in Ireland. This council provides a myriad of grants and schemes to anyone who can make a valid case for the preservation of heritage and culture in Ireland. There's a great many of competing interests for their funding as its responsibility uh, mandate encompasses more than just maritime heritage. The council offers also the museum standards programs for Ireland, which promotes professional standards in the care of collections in Irish museums and galleries. Um, this program recognizes the achievement of those standards through accreditation. It also offers assistance for both the care of the tangible and intangible objects by a myriad of means through conservation, uh, conservation internships, education and training. It also offers a national integrated online resource called the Irish Archive Resource. This resource provides access to a broad range of Irish historical archives. This is just a, but a brief uh, overview of their work and I invite uh, others who are interested to check out their websites. The National uh, Museum of Ireland holds several artifacts of antiquity regarding Irish maritime heritage and culture. However, maritime heritage and culture, again, is not necessarily their only uh, objective. The museum also houses maritime artifacts uh, at their subsidiary branch, Colin, uh, uh, um, Cahal Barra, um, Barra um, Barracks Museum in Dublin, which houses the Ketch Asgard. And, in, uh, and most importantly, the conservation unit, which is presently conserving artifacts from the Spanish Armada wreck La Juliana. Um, the Asgard, uh, I must mention, was a, a critical to Irish independence uh, as it was active as a, um, a gun runner. Uh, uh, it's also on display there. 
Both museums uh, are well worth a visit if you find yourself in Dublin. Another uh, closely associated museum with the National Museum of Ireland is the Museum of Country Life uh, and Castle Bar County Mayo in the west of Ireland. It holds many specialised articles of maritime interest, particularly related to fisheries, though again maritime heritage is n and, s and culture is not necessarily their main focus. The National Maritime Museum of Ireland, located in Dunleary, a suburb of Dublin city, houses perhaps the greatest single collection of maritime material heritage and culture, if not the most diverse collection of maritime artefacts in Ireland. It is closely associated with the Maritime uh, Institute. It is recognised as a national museum, even though it's kind of uh, privately run through uh, the Maritime Institute and its membership. The Maritime Institute was initially formed by ex-military personnel, ex-merchant mariners and others uh, with an interest in preserving and promoting maritime heritage and culture in Ireland. Their collection uh, is housed in a 185-year-old mariner's church and would be um, Ireland's equivalent to Fat Margaret's uh, collection uh, of Estonia, um, though it's not as large, I don't think. Among its vast and diversified collection to all uh, aspects of maritime endeavours is one of uh, unique artefacts is a French longboat from the late 18th century. It also contains many artefacts uh, of Captain Halpin, master of the Great Eastern, a pioneer of transatlantic cable laying. The extent of its collection is far too numerous to state here. Suffice to say it's worth a visit again if you're in Dublin. I'm promoting Dublin here I guess. Uh, it's also a research centre and library that holds very, several rare volumes of Irish maritime history and unique nautical charts. Uh, consultation of the library and archive centre is available to the public uh, by appointment. The library also conducts basic research of its archive to answer general queries of the, uh, to the public. It is also the venue for several related uh, events including lectures on maritime history. I would like to discuss also about a recent opening of the Passage West Museum in Passage West is a suburb of County Cork on the south coast of Ireland. The town was the birthplace of the first uh, steamship built in Ireland called the City of Cork in 1815. It is also the place um, uh, of a very early steamship construction, uh, wooden ship and boat construction. The town historically was uh, also a place where ships were lightened for trade for Cork City and lasted into the 19th century. It was the home of several mariners, including again Captain Richard Roberts, captain of the first steamship SS Styrius uh, to cross the Atlantic and therefore the first ship to hold the Blue Ribbon. The town was later used as a US naval base for US sub chasers during the period of the First World War. During the Irish Civil War in 1922-1923, after Ireland's independence, it was the scene of the first landing of free state forces by sea and then ensuing battle which effectively led to the end of the Irish Civil War. The people of, of Passage West, which is like a rural community, um, they led a, a grassroots organisation, wanted to engage in their maritime heritage and culture and set up a committee. The focus of the museum centres on telling the story of uh, Passage West and its relation with the sea. The committee was headed up by a man by the name of Jim Mur Murphy and his daughter Angela. Their work was instrumental in not only the establishment but the daily running of the museum. Their success story makes a great case study for the achievement in the area of maritime heritage and culture if the initiative is there. The museum planned to open a maritime research centre to further their endeavours to popularise maritime heritage and culture. Um, I would have liked to have talked more about the Inish Owen Maritime Museum and Planetarium, located in Greencastle and Donegal in the northwest of Ireland, the Arklow Maritime Museum at Bridgeport Arklow in Wicklow, which is near Dublin uh, somewhat, and the Ross Lair uh, Maritime Heritage Centre. Uh, in County Wexford, which is in the southwest of the country. I got to mention the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group and others, but the time constraints don't permit me to do that in detail. I can provide details uh, for those interested after the lecture. I must not forget our compatriots in the north of Ireland. There are two museums well worth noting regarding maritime heritage and culture. The first is the Ulster Folk 
Transport Museum in Bangor County Down. The second is the Titanic Museum in Belfast City, which has proven extremely popular in promoting the historic shipbuilding culture of Belfast. In conclusion, Ireland has a great potential to take advantage of its incredible resource of maritime heritage and culture if it changes its maritime thinking, which is happening. Um, an increased vigilance over shipwrecks and the seas is warranted. This, along with a more stringent policy of maritime activities for users of the sea, is also needed, in my opinion. The critical uh, support of national and local government is critical to the survival, maintenance and promotion of maritime heritage and culture in Ireland. This includes the continuation of surveys to better access and monitor our wreck sites for greater protection, the formation of grass groups and interested individuals using various social platforms has proven also immensely useful in Ireland to the popularization of our maritime heritage and culture. Thank you very much. Is there very much collaboration between these uh, different uh, institutions, organizations, museums or...? or be honest, well, the, I, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm like a member of the Passage West Maritime Museum, but um, um, they are a specific local group and they're um, interested in, in the history of their area. So uh, there is cooperation, there is a lot of, they're cooperating now with UCC at the moment, they're starting to explore different strategies on how to uh, make it more academic and to make, in, in, increase it. There is cooperation there. Um, there's also uh, cooperation between the different uh, Irish government agencies working um, in tandem over different areas in maritime heritage. Um, I, I don't know how conclusive it is. I, I know that there is a lot of groups active, but some of them uh, struggle as well as uh, for funding, you know, and even though their heritage is magnificent and their archives are are quite good. Um, uh, funding has been, uh, for, for museums in more remote areas, they don't get the, the numbers, as opposed to like the Titanic Museum, which is, you know, it's phenomenal, um, the amount of attention that it's gotten, and it's extremely popular. Um, um, so it, it, it depends. Yes, there is cooperation, and it, uh, uh, very much so, but um, there are also kind of like independent groups as well. I, I don't know if that adequately answers your question. I hope so. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and welcome up uh, uh, Marco Marilla, uh, who is uh, going to speak about the scope of maritime archaeology in higher education and popularization. And uh, uh, Marco is a postdoctoral researcher in the cultural heritage study at the University of Turku. And his doctoral thesis was a philosophical and historiographical study of the role of, and reliance of speculation in the ontology and epistemology of archaeology. Since then, you have researched the history, theory and pedagogy of uh, maritime archaeology, as well as the aesthetics and ecologies of emergent heritage. Welcome to the stage. Okay, so my, uh, my question today is going to be how to teach maritime archaeology. How, how should we teach maritime archaeology? And, and the background to this question is the, the, the postdoctoral work that I did for uh, uh, Professor Kristin Ilves at the University of Helsinki. And uh, that research was done to uh, uh, support the, the development of a complete degree, what was to become a complete degree program in maritime archaeology at the University of Helsinki. And uh, so, in order to uh, support that uh, development, uh, we looked into the, uh, the, the sort of reasons or, uh, for successful, why teaching and, and degree programs around the world have been successful. And so first, we, we ran into these uh, sort of like quick answers to the, to the question, how to teach maritime archaeology at a university. So basically, there is no formula uh, for education in maritime archaeology. This is the quick answer to the question. And it's more important to follow one's uh, intuitions and emotions. But naturally, this wasn't enough. We can't base, uh, we can't do research-based uh, development of teaching uh, on these grounds. So 
what we did was uh, a quite extensive historical research on the topic, uh, which we have published in this uh, report uh, a couple of years ago. And as part of that, we conducted some uh, interviews and uh, an online, did an online survey for uh, professionals who uh, work in the, in the uh, field of maritime archaeology internationally. And what we learned uh, during that, uh, in that research was that like, we know that maritime archaeology programs are notorious for uh, becoming discontinued or cancelled, uh, which is basically due to stuff uh, retiring or like uh, uh, leaving and not being uh, replaced by, by new stuff. So we want to avoid this situation where a degree program is cancelled when, when the next uh, departmental restructuring takes place and, and the, you need budget cuts and, and the small, small discipline of maritime archaeology is the first to go. So what we learned is that we have to integrate uh, that teaching uh, with other teaching at, at the university, namely, most importantly, heritage studies, history, ethnology, maybe biology as well. So the point is to make yourself irre irreplaceable in, in a sense and, and, the, and the discipline and, the, and, and that research tradition to make yourself important uh, in the grander scheme of, uh, of uh, historical research and, and archaeological research. So what you really need is uh, like a lot of uh, collaboration with, uh, with other disciplines, uh, joint teaching uh, and uh, curriculum that is designed uh, on, on the premise of uh, integration rather than, like, uh, rather than uh, an isolated uh, degree program. And what this does is it sort of promotes a sense of multidisciplinarity. And, and we have, uh, uh, in, in other published research, uh, mainly taken a look at, at, at the history of maritime archaeology in Finland. And, and what we see, realize is that a teaching in maritime archaeology in Finland has always been very multidisciplinary and very well integrated with other, other disciplines. But what we also realized was that there's a lot of thematic gaps in, in published research. So building on all of this, we want to promote a sort of uh, multidisciplinary uh, understanding of, of, uh, of maritime archaeology. Also to build towards more uh, varied and, and nuanced teaching and research in the future. So what we did in order to implement these findings in the actual teaching was uh, the design and, and implementation of an online, introductory online course uh, in maritime archaeology. And this was taught for the first time last fall uh, in Turku and in Helsinki at, 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 at the University of Helsinki and at the Open University in Helsinki. And sort of as a as a way of making people interested in maritime archaeology. And the aim was to offer a very like, varied and, and, and uh, broad uh, understanding of what maritime archaeology can be. So it's, it's an online learning experience. That's what we call it. And, and on, the, on the platform for which we used ThingLink, uh, uh, by the way, so it allows uh, us to have these thematic pages and, and add links onto those, uh, those images or video and, and sort of like create tours and, and, and embed information and links to videos and, and literature on those uh, pages. So, so the student proceeds along this marked path uh, going from, from one thematic uh, page to, to the next clicking on the links and, and has access to literature and, 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 and the lectures that were produced for this, for the, for this platform. Uh, over 40, 40 people provided 
lectures for this, uh, this course. So it's really a, quite a, an extensive collection of, of uh, lectures on, on a very v wide uh, uh, variety of uh, approaches from development. So in, altogether we have 11 thematic, such thematic pages from development of vessel types to for, uh, boat building to life on board, uh, navigation, trade, life ways, world views, uh, maritime heritage, uh, conservation, public outreach, and uh, mar maritime archaeology and contemporary art. So we were then wondering how might this such an eclectic uh, collection of uh, different approaches work? How might students uh, see this? Does it increase their interest in uh, in maritime archaeology, does it make sense? And so we conducted uh, student surveys uh, prior to them taking the course and after. And actually what we, what we learned was uh, encouraging students uh, thought that the, uh, uh, the, the thematic uh, contents of the, of, of the lectures uh, wasn't confusing and that uh, the variety was uh, actually inspiring and that the, the, the large amount uh, of lectures wasn't off-putting. So it was actually like 86.4% 80, of the students thought that the amount of lectures was fitting. So uh, in total we had something like 16 hours and 45 minutes of, of lectures plus links to uh, sources, sources, resources outside the platform and, and links, etc. Uh, we also wanted to know which, which thematic sections the students found most interesting. And there's a lot of variety here. Uh, people seem to like this uh, world views uh, theme in, in particular. It's, it has a lot of lectures on, on cosmology and, and religion and, uh, uh, and such, such topics. On the other hand, we also ask them which, which of the themes left them feeling indifferent and uninspired. And what's, what sort of jumps out is this uh, the, the theme of maritime archaeology and contemporary art. So this was something that we wanted to include as a sort of uh, unexpected addition, an unexpected approach. And uh, this got us thinking about the relevance and, and like really like also rethink the purpose of, of including uh, artistic approaches in teaching of maritime archaeology. And and uh, so we we realized that 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 the value of 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 an artistic approach or promoting artistic thinking in in the sciences uh, altogether in general is a sort of like uh, uh, promotion of uh, uh, metaphorical thinking and the 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 whole centrality of water as a metaphor in human cognition and, and, and human culture and history is such a central theme that uh, I think there's, there's a lot of potential for may, maybe like going further with this uh, 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 this uh, sort of metaphorization of, of, uh, of water for the purpose, purpose of May, making water feel important and, and making maritime environments feel, feel important through the use of metaphors. And that's why I'm going to play for you. Uh, how, how much time do I have? Do I have seven minutes? <laughs> and uh, can I have some help? I can't. How does it work? Just bring up the... So this is an example from that uh, maritime archaeology and contemporary art thematic page. It's, uh, it's 
Thank you. you Are, okay. Uh, Jeff Benjamin, who is an American archaeologist and artist, and for the course he he wrote a poem uh, on a on a watery and and archipelagic and maritime theme. So when you hear like we're going to conclude with this uh, this this poem, but when you hear Jeff read out his poem, pay attention to the the metaphors and the, the watery and and maritime metaphors that he uses, and and see how that makes makes you feel about water and the maritime environment. Benjamin, I'm an art. Okay, there's no sound. Geologist and an artist, and I'm living um, in the Catskill Mountains of New York State. Been here for the past 10, 20 years or so, and um, I'm interested in. Uh, my research is, is interested in the intersection of art and archaeology and also uh, the, the sensory uh, aspects of industrialization. Um, and so I'm now going to read a poem um, that I created uh, called Archipelagy and it's associated with some anthotype prints and photographs as well. Archipelagy. The solution precedes the problem. The problem arises as soon as we have finished consuming the solution. I find no discourse on the land. The dry dust curls into the empty corners of silent stone foundations. My mouth becomes heavy and I become mute. Speech is uncompensated manual labor obligatory repetition of words, sentences, slogans, and phrases. To preserve the joy and musicality of speech, we adopt the terseness of our ancestors. We only mutter words that can be spoken as the body shifts from stone to stone, as the stones are stacked into walls that divide the dry, hard land. In between breaths, we say simple words like here, sun, hot, drink. When I turn to the water and ask the water, then suddenly the land becomes jealous of my attention, and it cries out to tell me its stories. It loses its shy taciturnity. The beings of the land emerge and multiply, and the songs and stories spill out of crevices and caves, from within dead and living trees, and from the dense grass. In a cacophonous roar, I must contend with an overwhelming simultaneity. The forms, creatures, and beings seem to say, laughing, you will have everything all at once or nothing at all. Standing in the fraught and contentious riparian co-ontology of the shoreline, we frantically record our observations in notebooks, our machinus intellectus, trying to keep up with the pace of events. There is no timeline, no sequence, no order to events. It all appears in a moment. We are connoisseurs of the moment, the shy glance. A fox circles around the church to get another look. Being is said in many ways, says Aristotle. Being cannot be one thing. It is plural. And yet the water remains silent. We are sitting in a rowboat, talking to friends on the shore. We lift our oars for a moment and listen and silently drift in the still open bay. We hear the water dripping from the oars. We hear every word spoken on the far shore. We hear the ringing of silverware on plates. A cormorant adds to our reverie, the peal of a single bell. One sound is full of so many different luxurious sounds. Sounds do not just project, they also receive, they listen. We try to locate the sounds that can hear other sounds. They expand and contract. I laid in the sand to recover from my illness and with great kindness, you placed a blanket over me. I fell asleep listening to the language of waves, thinking about how beautiful it is that the islands continue to increase, to rise, to rebound. As I fell asleep on the sand, I felt buoyant, lifted and held by the earth and water. My feet on Quarsalo were pointed towards the same waves that caused the fenders in Vinyl Haven and Hurricane to dance, 
All of my efforts seemed so silly when I witnessed the water's casual buoyancy. I recall that I have imagination. I do not need to strive just to live with and fully experience each successive solution and wait patiently and with certainty for the problems to follow them. Of course, I know it's not as simple as the problem is on the land and so the solution is in the water. That's not a fair equation. But as viewed from the possible shore of Kuning Kansari, the rage of distant lands becomes a rich fertile soil into which I cast the seeds of my imagination. In Vinyl Haven, they quarried and turned the massive columns of St. John the Divine. They turned hard granite into liquid form. They turned stone into music. Static forms do not offend me, even as I think of them in motion. The post office, the custom house, statues and gargoyles. I ponder and wonder about the motives of their creators. Here on the stone coast, their creators lived and died. They came from distant islands to live on this one. They came with humor and song, which they carved into stone. I am told that sometimes if I just hoist a sail, the wind will take me there on its own accord. Of course, even the rocks of the earth are fluid form, but we are impatient. So we turn to more basic motive forces like the sun, the wind, the currents, forces that move in ways that are perceptible to us. When I turn to the sky and water, the land becomes jealous of my attention and it tugs at my shirt to speak. I have to pretend not to care or notice. It is a silly lover's game. Lovers forget that the water will turn into ice. Islands are good for thinking and feeling, even when they're frozen, or perhaps especially so. Archipelagical thought is aphoristic thought, island hopping of the mind. And in between the waters, the currents, the motion, 90% boredom and 1% terror, as sailors will say, gradations of light, veils of moisture, reflections in the sky deflected clouds, a pulsating realm of mirage and illusion. Clouds. Islands cause one to think aphoristically, to look for nuance and subtlety. Archipelagy is an antidote to the tyranny of semiconductor thinking, the hegemony of the doped circuit, gateway thoughts, in or out, yes or no, on or off, flashing screens, blinking lights and alarms, terrestrial sterility and poverty. On the island shoreline, we re rediscover chiaroscuro, blending of forms, changing, morphing. We find it in chlorophyll. And of course, there will always be separation, boundaries, the mystery of existence, me doing stuff over here, other people doing stuff over there. To reverse Dunn's maxim, and quite thankfully, no island is a man. The solution, by definition, is fluid. One day I will tell you about how I walked from Vinyl Haven to Kuning Kansari, but that is a tale of the past. I wish to tell it, but the present moment takes up so much of my time. Okay, that's my poem. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Do you know why you think that this uh, course with the uh, contemporary art was not appreciated as much as the other things? Was it like the, the conception that this isn't maritime archaeology or uh, the course in itself because when I looked at this and when I heard your presentation and I also when we have been working on the, the exhibitions at Rock and the first exhibition is quite poetic and it's like a bridge mm. between like an exhibition and and then science and it feels to me very important and of course mm. that I would really appreciate but do you know why it was uh, I think it we sort of left it in the air, like how, how it ties into the rest of the course. What's the relevance of this sort of like expression and, and form and, and way of uh, putting things and, and what's the like relevance of uh, and importance of different types of uh, like expressing things through different sorts of media as, as, as like uh, opposed to writing and, mm -hmm. and, and like the, the more common academic mm -hmm. uh, forms and, and, and mediums. So I, I think it like maybe we could have done, done a better job with uh, like contextualizing it in it um, like in a more 
like uh, explicit way I, I would I would say yeah thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation uh, and my question is um, uh, for how long time uh, did you ask uh, from the students was it a one year course or was it five year project maybe you already told but I missed it <laughs> you mean the level of the students like how uh, no, I mean, uh, was it only uh, the students from one year who were listening to the course, or was it a couple of years uh, who were listening? Uh, yeah, so it, uh, the, 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 the students, the student body comprised of uh, students from different, like, uh, uh, different, different years, and, and some had, had, some were first year students, and, and a lot of the open university students were uh, uh, also like um, uh, students with with, with uh, very little experience in in, in studying archaeology or maritime archaeology. Many had no experience in maritime archaeology whatsoever. But we also included as a control group uh, uh, graduated. And, and, and like professional archaeologists, none of those, none of which were actually maritime archaeologists. So uh, now I can't remember if if maybe there was uh, was someone who was uh, like uh, involved in maritime archaeology. Maybe not. So basically, what it comes down to is that like people with different uh, levels of experience and, and none, none of them like from maritime archaeology explicitly. So have been thinking about doing it like open lectures or so on or is it uh, uh, just for students the material? Uh, it's not publicly available mm. due to copyright issues so we can only like we want to provide literature to students so we, 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 have, we have to control the, the <laughs> the way that people get have access to that, that, but some of the lectures are openly available uh, on uh, on YouTube. So we used YouTube, and and most of the lectures are unlisted on YouTube. So they they will not show up in searches, and and you need to have the link to access those those. But there are also some public lectures. Yeah. So if you go on on YouTube and and search for perspectives in maritime archaeology, you will be able to find the, the channel and, and you will find some lectures uh, on that channel, but most of the lectures are only accessible through that, that course uh, platform. Uh, what do you think about um, the Deputy Secretary uh, Lanneron's uh, comment on uh, engaging young students on uh, 6th to 8th grade from a pedagogical point of view in, in getting an interest for the sea or marine archaeology, you know, getting him into all various programs. If you'd care to comment on that, I just was Who, Whose comment? Um, the, it was the comment of the, the secretary this morning on uh, Lannerand. Lannerand. Uh, he made a comment, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, in yeah. my experience as well, uh, I've heard it in other lectures, um, to get children interested at a very young age, interested in maritime affairs, um, seagoing careers, all of the above, Maritime archaeology included. Mm. I was wondering if you want would uh, care to spend a few comments or make a well, few comments. Well, my, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, I fail to see the. Of course, maybe like uh, statistically speaking, if we make make people do or steer people at a young age, they will like more. They're more likely to like continue on that path. But like it took me. 25 years before I like had any idea what I want to research as I do with my life, so uh, I'm very much a drifter uh, when it comes to finding my own uh, calling or devotion, and 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 so I don't know. I I, I really don't like have any uh, any any other like. Uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. First presenter is going to be Hilda Maria Klettenberg, and she has been defending her graduate uh, thesis in Tartu University in 2020, and she has been focused and is very interesting, very interested about um, uh, 
about education and the museums. And she's been doing her studies also about art museums and the maritime museum and so on. So Hilda, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Hilda Maria and uh, I will be presenting my master thesis. Therefore, my performance today is mainly related uh, to integration of primary schools and upper secondary schools and museum education. The topic of the thesis was chosen due to my personal interest in museum education and to the desire, desire uh, to improve existing opportunities. The national curriculum of the primary and secondary school provides for free education and study in museum, but museum museum's lessons usually cost money. The location of the school about which I started looking for information with my thesis has also sets limitations for using the opportunities. The purpose of my th thesis was to find a connection between the location of the school and the frequency of visits to museum lessons. The hypothesis was that the frequency of study visits depends on the location of the school and schools is larger centers have better financial opportunities. There were uh, four research questions. First one is how does the frequency of museum visits in schools in Harju County differ from other counties using the example of the Estonian Maritime Museum. Second question was how do teachers museum education experiences differ by location. Third question was what factors influence the frequent participation of remote schools in museum education. And the last question was, what support measures or funding sources do schools use to attend file trips? I uh, used both qualitative and quantitative research methods, so it was a combi combined method. A quantitative research method was necessary to study the statistics of the Merton Museum. Qualitative, however, in order to conduct interviews with teachers from selected schools. The research process started with statistics. I was given access to the Maritime Museum's visiting statistics from 2014-2015 study year onwards. Firstly, all the schools that visited the museum lessons in the groups by county. Then I investigated how many times each county visited. Later, I also took uh, into account the number of students in each year in each county and the number of visits and calculated how many students out of 1000 visited the museum. Uh, at first, uh, the plan was to select the teachers from the least and most visited counties and schools, but since many did not wish to participate, so I, uh, I also sent uh, invitations to other counties and interviewed all the teachers who expressed a wish. A total of uh, 14 interviews were held with uh, eight counties. The theory part of the thesis was about the nature of museum education, gave an overview of possible problems such as funding, describe the teachers' current beliefs, the education system, schools' culture, culture and the socioeconomic situation. The chapter also gave a brief overview of the history of museums. Visual and hands-on experience help students acquire knowledge better. Studying at the museum has more freedom than at school. Attendance, attendance is not mandatory and grades are not given, but the curriculum is still followed in order to bring the necessary knowledge to the students with the lessons offered. Studying in the museum is included in the national curriculum. Museum lessons cost money, but education is free. Therefore, teachers cannot make museum lessons mandatory for students. Throughout, proje throughout projects, it is sometimes possible to get lessons for free, but there are no endless projects either. From the fall of this year, Kulturi Ranit started supporting school students studying in museum with 1 million euros per year, which means only 7.6 euros per student for which should be able to visit the theatre and cinema, not only the museum. For the given money, only two, one two visits could be made. In many cases, transport is also added. Then not even one visit may be worth the money. So this support will be insufficient. The table 
shows visits to museum lessons for six years. The frequency of visits was similar between years. Rises and falls occurred uh, simultaneously in all countries. The increases could be due to various popular muse museum lessons, such as the Vikings Museum lesson in 2016, which was uh, visited as many as 184 times, while the design lines were due to the temporary closure of one museum building. On average, over the course of uh, six years, the most people visited the Har from Haru County, then Nidaviru County and Lanaviru County. Hiu County was visited the least. To make the results as equal as possible, I calculate visits per thousand students in each county. Later, I calculated the six-year average. According to the results of six years, the largest number of students from Haru County attend the Maritime Museum museum lessons, which was also logical due to the location of the museum. Lainaviru, Järva and Jugava counties were not far behind Haru County. The reason may be that Tallinn is the center of attraction for these counties. Tartu is further away. Hiu County and Laina County were visited the least. However, the results were different by year. For example, in the year 2016-2017, uh, Järva and Jägava counties were ahead of Aru County. The given results were obtained only based on the data of Estonian Maritime Museum, so it cannot be claimed that the situation of Estonian museum education is exactly like this. The statistics revealed that the location affects the frequency of going to study in museum, but it is not only influencing factor. The rest of factors came out during the interviews. I divided the conducted interviews into four groups according to distance. I analyzed the answers received in four groups, but the answers came out quite similar regardless of the location. The majority difference was in frequency of attending museum lessons. The interviews revealed that the teachers consider learning in museum classes to be a very important part of their education. For example, expanding one's horizons, the importance of the different environment and new people and more efficient acquisition of knowledge were brought out. All the teachers who participate in the interview spoke at the beginning of how necessary and uh, important learning in museum is. But uh, only six out of the 14 teachers always replaced their lesson with the museum lesson. Also, these uh, six teachers may not be 100% res principal as during the interview. It was discussed what role the museum lesson, lesson really plays in their eyes. Only three teachers considered the museum lesson to be completely equal to school lesson, lesson who let the absent students familiarize, familiarize themselves with the topic and uh, solve tasks. Some teachers go to a museum with students uh, one, two times a year, while someone three times a week. It was the only one and only places where the effect of location was felt. Bad location, lack of money and time were cited as reasons why schools in remote areas do not visit museums more. Some teachers were, were concerned about their own work schedule, while others were concerned about the students' timetable and the lessons of the other teachers, or in general of the school's culture, school level and education system. Teachers get a lot more extra work from one five trip, which shows how rigid the education system in reality is and the attitude of school towards extracurricular learning. Due to all this, it is not surprising why some teachers have a more negative attitude towards attending museum classes. But in fact, the teachers also influence us. Often, one study session, session is a whole day work, especially in schools far from the centers. Therefore, several activities are combined. Science, it does not make sense to make a trip for only 45 minutes. 
However, such moves easily acquire an entailing meaning. Uh, during the interviews, I asked uh, 14 uh, teachers what funding sources they use and uh, who and what they think should do it. All the interviews involved asking the parent for money. As many as 10 out of uh, 14 teachers say that the parents are their main source of funding. Throughout the projects, some visits are sometimes obtained, but the parents still pay for majority. The other four teachers are helped by the school or municipality when paying for museum lesson or transportation, but not completely. Teachers do not want uh, to re re rely only the parents' wallet, so they rather avoid attending museum lessons. According to teachers, there are parents who say that education is free and why should they pay? At the same time, uh, two teachers say that their parents do not see problem with paying because they are their own children. The economic status of the family also plays a role in attitude of the parents and average income of the residents in Hayu County is higher than the other counties, which can also explain the receptiveness of parents in terms of payment. According to the teacher, the expressness uh, related to teaching should be covered either by the municipality and the school or by the Ministry of Education and Research and not by the children parents. The question to the first question, uh, the answer for the quest, uh, first question was predictable and how your county was visited the most. Surprisingly, Lana Viru, Järva and Yugava counties also achieved similar results. The reason is probably the location and good transport connection. Tallinn is probably the center of transportation for these regions. The answer to the second question was more unexpected, as the location did not affect the scenario answers. The reason and programs for visiting the museum were similar in the eyes of the teachers who participated in the interview. The factors that influenced the participation in museum lessons of distance and uh, also closer school were time, location, money, school culture, school level, teacher and education system. And, uh, and in response to the last question, I received that the main source of funding is the parent of the children, sometimes also individual projects. Uh, in the course of the thesis, it became clear that the location of the school and the frequency of visits to museum lessons are related. Harju County and its neighbors, Lanaviru and Yarva County, visited the Maritime Museum more than the other counties during the sixth year. But regardless of location, the factors influencing participation in museum, museum education are similar. Thus, the hypothesis was partially confirmed. In general, however, going to a museum and studying there is very unhuman because if you live far from the center, it inevitably takes more time and uh, money. More equal condi conditions are urgently needed. And uh, finally, I present my own solutions to make learning in the museum more equal across Estonia. I will present this possible solution today at the conference as well. Maybe my wishes will go further. The first uh, recommendation is better cooperation between the teacher and the museum. As the result of uh, which museum lessons or study days for tools coming from further, a uh, faith called be created, which will take into account the teacher wishes, school level, specific, specific uh, features of the class, necessary subject, subjects, and so on. Lesson cycles containing pre and the post activities could also be of interest to teachers. Uh, supplementing the curriculum and museum days. Studying in a museum is included uh, in the national curriculum, but only as a recommendation. Therefore, not all schools take it seriously. The solution would be to add museum, museum days to the curriculum, and this must be expressed more clearly. Dispersal of museum, 
Currently, there is a wide se selection of different museums, mainly only in larger centers. This is not how you can talk about equality. We can't move cities, but we can move museums and activities. More opportunities should be used, uh, such as a uh, museum in a uh, suitcase, online classes, traveling expeditions, or quest classes with specialists. Museum could cooperate with each other and offer the same lessons in museums in smaller centers. And uh, financial support for museum lessons, the state, including the Ministry of Education and Research, and the Ministry of Culture could see the importance of learning in a museum and support it. Kulturilanits is doing the right thing and it is worth investing in, the, in it. And then uh, transport support. If direct financi financial support is not possible, a few trips a year from school to the museum, museum could be made possible for school students at the expense of free county lines and the training of teachers and education workers. In the initial and in-service training of the teachers, more emphasis should be placed on learning in different learning environments. And the last uh, recommendation was a cooperate, cooperation between teachers. Similar to the previous point, one should first understand the importance of extracurricular learning and then cooperate, contribute to task and so on. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Hilda Maria, very much. It was very interesting and very nice presentation. But we have to move on. And um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next uh, presenter, Tiffany Nuberi. She's going to talk about the role of volunteer organizations in the popularization of marital cultural heritage. And uh, just to introduce you that uh, Tiffany is a long time member of the Badewanne team. It's a deep diver. Uh, like a team and, uh, and she's also works with the technical dive education and she's going to open the theme about how we can involve and how we can even more popularize the knowledge uh, of the maritime cultural heritage. Thank you. It's so lovely to be here. Um, it's also very exciting for me because I don't work at a museum um, and I don't work in uh, archaeology. I'm just a diver. Um, but during this day, um, I've got a really, really long list of museums that I think I have to visit now, after all your really, really great presentations. Um, so thank you all so much for that. Um, but as I said, um, I'm a diver, um, and I'm here today representing the Badawana team um, and what we do. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the Badawana team is a non-profit organization that has been operating around uh, the Baltic Sea for more than 25 years. The team originally started off uh, being Finnish, with just Finnish divers, but is now made up of multinational divers with a whole range of different skill sets, um, but that all have the same common goals and interests. Our main targets of interest have been wrecks from the First and Second World War um, in the Gulf of Finland and the Baltic proper. Although more recently we have um, put quite a lot of time and focus on uh, older wooden wrecks such as flute ships. We have had ongoing collaborations with uh, maritime agencies like uh, the Estonian and the Finnish um, agencies for many years now and we continue to work together successfully on different projects. Um, but being able to do what we do and to be able to see and experience all these amazing things underwater we feel obliged to bring these stories that otherwise would have been forgotten to the surface and to share it with everybody else so that they too can see, share and learn from our findings. But what is it that we do and what can voluntary groups like Bardavana offer? So the team members of Bardavana have different backgrounds uh, resulting in quite a diverse knowledge bank. The divers on the teams um, all have different pro professions, which means that we also bring experience and knowledge from our own areas of expertise. Um, for example, on the team we have uh, scientific divers, marine archaeologists, maritime, um, uh, yes, marine biologists, maritime archaeologists, and professional dive instructors and engineers. 
So using all of this um, and combining all of this knowledge, um, we can work together very, very efficiently um, on the wrecks and with the stories. We've also got many, many years of advanced diving behind us, and we've invested very highly in our own uh, personal dive training and equipment, resulting that we can carry out work underwater in a very proficient manner. Uh, one of the examples of the equipment and the investment we've done is that we're all on closed circuit rebreathers. Traditionally, you see um, people working underwater with uh, open circuit sisters, systems, so a traditional scuba tank and a regulator in the mouth. We're working with these closed circuit systems which um, give us a lot of advantages. Uh, sadly, I don't have time to talk about that today. Um, but that's one of the biggest investments that we've done probably in our own personal diving careers. And also with the training that we've invested in, um, especially when it comes to working at deeper depths. Um, we have a lot less time working at deeper depths, so you want everything to run really, really smoothly and not wasting any time. So a quick example of that is if we do a dive to around about 100 meters and we spend one minute working on the bottom, that results in approximately 10 minutes more of decompression. So 10 minutes longer before we can reach the surface. So just with that example, you can see how important it is that we don't waste any time and that we are very efficient underwater. We've also developed various skills like videography, photography, and photogrammetry. And we're also able to perform these with ease underwater, along with having uh, familiarity of our own equipment and procedures for these kind of dives. So the combination of the knowledge that we have, the levels of the diving that we do, and the skill sets that we have mean that we can perform tasks underwater at a very high le level, making us capable of doing almost anything necessary for archaeology in uh, deep waters. So what advantage does using divers have, especially for deeper things? But when using divers instead of remote operated vehicles, there are several advantages. The mobility and the real-time awareness we have um, as divers can assist in making faster decisions due to the ease that we can actually move around freely underwater. Um, and we can use our own sensors. Um, we don't need to rely on somebody steering or looking through a computer screen. You can just imagine like walking around this room, looking at different things. I can make different decisions a lot easier than having a restricted field of view. Um, so it's always gonna be easier when you can use the sensors um, and that we have as humans. And we also have uh, higher efficiency and precision when it comes to taking samples or performing a task underwater, meaning that there can be less damage to both the wreck and the environment around the wreck. Because, of course, then again, using our hands is going to be easier than using, for example, robotic arms or other sampling methods that could compromise results and details. In many cases, the responsible agencies don't have their own deep divers, and procuring them can be very expensive. And with most projects, as you have mentioned today, budget, there's uh, often quite restriction in budget. So using volunteering, volunteer diving groups can be a big help with this. Saying that, that does not mean um, that we do everything for free but the costs are generally much smaller than the salaries of commercial divers and the platforms that, that are used to run that type of uh, operation. So with all of this said, we are a minority. 0.075% of the world's population are divers and only around 5% of them are technical divers. And even less so the numbers of technical divers that can operate in the dark and the cold and the low visibility conditions like the Baltic Sea have. But despite us being such a small percentage and a minority, 
we're still capable of bringing up so many stories and so, many, so much information that we can share with everybody. So, oh, that's where it's cut off. Um, how does Bardavana contribute to the popularization and awareness of maritime culture and what kind of platforms do we use? We share our findings and knowledge um, in our own social media, both as a team and as individual team members, enabling us to reach a large and diverse audience, hopefully with this re uh, creating a ripple effect and sparking more interest in the history, understanding and the preservation of the wrecks. Some of the team members have presented in different international conferences, uh, sharing within our own communities. And yearly, so a few of our storage stories are published in uh, larger newspapers and international magazines with their own different target audiences. We also contribute to and collaborate with different agencies and museums with the information and the images that we have acquired on our own dives. Um, sometimes also performing particular tasks that contribute to their studies and surveys. We've also been able and fortunate to contribute to larger scale documentaries such as the National Geographic's Nazi Sunken Sub um, that was released in 2012 and involves the sinking of the U-745. This has reached a worldwide audience and it's currently on major streaming platforms, which means that it's continuously accessible to the public. And up and coming for us, uh, one of the guys in the team has written a book or is writing a book um, that will be published in summer and autumn of 2023 called The Fog of War and is about the naval activities in the Gulf of Finland during World War I. The book is aimed to reveal recent history that has happened in the region that most of the public uh, aren't aware of. The incidents are viewed through the wrecks that we have investigated and the reader is taken down with us to the dark cellars of the Baltic Sea where all of these secrets are so very, very well kept. One of these secrets that has been really, really well kept in the Baltic Sea is also one of our most recent discoveries and I find a great example of um, collaboration between us and the Finnish Heritage Agency. The Swan. A flute ship that was found in the summer of 2020. Uh, we believed that we were going to be diving a uh, Russian minesweeper but instead we found this. It was built in 1636 and is now lying at 85 meters in the Gulf of Finland. The team have been diving and documenting it for the last few summers and we've been able to find out when it was built, clues to her name, and we've also recently taken samples um, of the cargo and successfully raised a window hatch that is now in the caring hands of the uh, Finnish Heritage's uh, Conservation Lab. We're also planning a collaborative effort to raise a transom in the beginning of next year. And we're really, really excited and looking forward to it. And I think everybody that is involved in that project feels the same. Um, we've covered, uh, briefly covered, a lot of you use photogrammetry, um, but to do a model like this at 85 meters, um, and I believe that the base model for this was done in two dives, so with a bottom time of probably 50 minutes, so you understand how uh, quick and efficient you need to be and how you need to know how all the equipment works underwater. Um, but the photogrammetry as a tool is such a great thing because not only can we perform and make the models and bring it up to show it to the marine archaeologist, we can also show others. We can also take people to the wreck um, through this visual aid that would never ever have a chance to go down and actually see it themselves. And uh, currently we have models of the wreck, uh, the rudder and uh, the transom plate. 
And you can see on the transom plate the swan that's carved really, really pretty. And if you look below the dead eye, the date um, of when it was built, or the year, 1636. So during the last two years of our dives to the Swan, we've been joined by a documentary team. Well, the aim of the documentary has been not only to show how we operate and work, but also to show the importance of the Baltic Sea as a trade route and what life would have been like back then. So to wrap things up, I'd like to show you a short uh, promotional video that was made by Handel Productions, and hopefully you'll get us more, in more insights to what we do. We can find the home port of the ship, ship uh, through the coat of arms uh, on the trans, but, but also, also remains of a, a name motive. motive. And, it and it could, could also, also be that we have an inscription, inscription that tells the year of construction, construction of this ship. It's like winning a lottery or winning a Nobel Prize. You can't get it better than this. Uh, like um, historians to go in into the archives and what archives are available 
um, on wrecks like that um, that you've discovered? Archives, as in like historical centres, national archives, like the Finnish archives. If, if there's any, yeah. you know. Um, Eva says yes, so then we do. Do you want to comment on that? I mean, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I, I will answer that question. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, there are archives available, and we, uh, well, it depends, of course, on the vessel we are researching. In this case, for example, we're talking about the Swan. It's uh, mainly the Dutch uh, archives and the uh, Swedish also. So we, we have some in Estonia as well, but the, the archives have been researched quite thoroughly. And the, at that time, uh, the 17th century is quite empty, let's say, in that sense. But we can't rule out that there will be something found also. There are different places to go. Also, Riga, for example, can be one of the possibilities uh, from the archival work. Sorry, Riga in Latvia. Oh, Riga. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just to answer you back. No, one of the interests, my own personal interest, and I don't want to take up too much time, is that um, I do a lot of research in different archives to try and put the story of one ship together. Like you might find archives in London, or you might find them in Italy, or in Freiburg, or you know, in, in wherever you know here. Um, different archives uh, document different things and you get different pieces like a jigsaw of the puzzle and you'd be surprised what you can find in archives of other countries. Um, some are very rich, some, some aren't. Um, and um, it's something that like you like to bring the stories alive tangibly. Um, something that I like to do exactly the same is that I, I do my, most of my research in archives that does the same thing, you know. So, and I think they can complement um, very much so, the telling of stories uh, of maritime heritage. So, yeah. Thank you. I think you're going to be able to answer this one. Maybe I, I didn't hear, but the documentary, yeah. uh, when it is going to be finished, and, and uh, how can we see it? I wish I knew. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew. They're still working on it. Yeah. Um, I believe they are presenting something about it in Tallinn in a week or two. Um, but no, um, but is it's it sort of left our yeah. table, it's up to the production company yeah. now. But is this going to be broadcasted or is it on the social media or do you know? I believe it's supposed to be broadcasted, but as I said, mm. um, we've done our work uh, okay. with them now and it's up to the production company what they choose to do with it. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you have any Swedish divers in your team? Nej. You're a Swedish diver. Oh. I'm just like a Svenska. Oh, we skip the others. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we skip the others. <laughs> uh, one problem for us, yep. archaeologists and government authorities, is that we can't hire you no. officially. No. So it has to be. So that's a problem. And our limit is 40 meters yep. when we have like five minutes. Yeah, I don't know about Gripson. The Gripson is very shallow. It's just yeah, yes. so it's no problem for us. No. Um, yeah, I think it's a Swedish problem. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's. I don't think it's so much of a. It must be something suspicious yeah. there. I have to talk with me like privately. Yes, crea they're creative. My question uh, deals with funding. How easy is, is it, or how much of the Padevan funding is like provided by foundations, and is that something that something that is possible in the first place? I think most of our funding is from foundations um, and grants. And Again, I can comment yeah, that. it's much better, Eva. Does this? <laughs> uh, so it actually depends on the activities we are doing or the project. For example, uh, for the Swan, uh, some of the funding comes through the, uh, the production company. They are also applying for it. It's not uh, coming out of their own pocket. But also we have uh, fin uh, financed ourselves uh, through the um, copyright uh, uh, material. For example, the, the, the uh, documentary, the previous one that we made for 
or basically we made the documentary together with uh, uh, another pro production company and then National Geographic just bought it from us. So that's how they operate. And also uh, other kind of uh, things, but yes, there are also uh, the foundations where we can apply for funding for specific tasks or for, sp uh, for civ specific, uh, these, uh, let's say, projects. Also, the, some of the funding comes from the national heritage agencies, again, so they can, of course, as I said, I don't know how it's in Finland, uh, the procurement process or whatever, but in Estonia, sometimes it's much easier to that they supply us, for example, with a vessel or something like that to cover some of the costs or something like that. But that's that's how the how work is done. And plus, of course, quite a lot comes out of our own pocket. Thank you, Tiffany, for introducing the work. <laughs> and now it's time to move back to Estonia. So the next presentation is going to introduce the Lahema coastal heritage communities from research of maritime culture to the self-identification through the Pohirana culture space. And uh, I'm very glad to invite Melika Kindel and Ave Paulus and maybe a little bit some words about you. That Ave is an expert in community-based heritage conservation and she's a senior cultural heritage specialist in the Environmental Board of Estonia, leader of the cultural heritage protection in Lahema, as well as president of ICOMAS Water Heritage Unit in Estonia. And, sorry, and Melika is actually a member of the uh, Pohirana community, and she's been def defending her thesis in Tartu University about the local stories and the role in the local um, tourist de de development and, uh, and mainly as I understand that you are now a member of the Society of Yuminda Peninsula and also that you uh, look at the aspects of the folklore and, and also how to involve the local community in the knowledge production. Uh, good evening everyone, uh, we are pleased that we are in here in front of you, thank you. And uh, I will start. Uh, uh, the Lahama National Park is uh, the first uh, national park in Estonia. It was established in 1971. Uh, and this is um, quite close to Tallinn. Uh, by car, only less than an hour driving eastwards. So, uh, and here in a map, you can see that uh, this, uh, this is, uh, uh, we have a quite uh, long, um, uh, coastal line about 145 kilometers. So we have a quite rich and uh, uh, diverse uh, maritime culture. Uh, just some keywords: uh, we have a uh, uh, fishery settlements, uh, villages. We have uh, um, lighthouses and uh, um, navigation marks along this uh, uh, coastal line. Uh, we have some. Uh, Coast uh, uh, coastal guards, coastal guard sta uh, stations, and also uh, two um, uh, m uh, marine rescue or sea rescue uh, stations, uh, and we have uh, this uh, tangible and intangible maritime culture. Uh, Folklore, uh, actually this area is uh, rich of uh, Estonian uh, runo songs, uh, this archaic, archaic uh, uh, folk uh, layer, and uh, mm, of course material uh, values like uh, uh, fishing sheds and um, boat landing uh, places, uh, building boats in this area, and of course, the quite important, in Casmo, uh, there was a, a maritime school at times, and actually this Casmo has been called uh, Captain Village. Uh, so quite rich uh, uh, heritage of uh, maritime culture. But the most important, this culture or the heritage is always connected with people. This is uh, people's, heritage. 
Ja, et endig vist Käsmo, Käsmo märitamist kui and Käsmo and started with the cooperation actually exactly Estonian Maritim ja siia meil Teele Saaris one of the authors on absolutely amazing Käsmo book so so the cooperation goes on 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 daily basis with uh, all the stakeholders and rights holders in the Lahama National Park. The the uh, beauty of that Lahama area is uh, that uh, we uh, in Lahama National Park there are 25 hectare 25,000 hectares of sea under state protection. So uh, uh, totally 75,000 hectares uh, under state protection where cultural heritage and maritime heritage is uh, is uh, protected by the state. Uh, but what is heritage? Uh, uh, here we can uh, uh, say that uh, uh, Estonia has ratified FARA Convention and heritage is uh, heritage as identified uh, so by heritage communities. And uh, uh, all, most of the uh, people here actually uh, from the countries uh, that have signed uh, or ratified uh, and or ratified the convention uh, uh, except Thailand and Sweden. Uh, uh, so Sweden has uh, maybe some, some cases with the Sami, so the, the, they are a bit afraid of uh, signing that convention. But uh, uh, and Ireland is actually, uh, as to daily basis, very, very, very good in heritage protection uh, uh, together with local communities. Uh, and. Uh, uh, me as uh, being the president of ICOMAS Estonia and the International Scientific Committee of Water, Heritage and Cultural Landscapes, uh, uh, I'm specifically uh, uh, glad uh, that together with local communities we actually made a, a, a small success story of Lahama National Park heritage protection because uh, 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 Lahama National Park, uh, it is a, a bit um, difficult situation because it was in a bit difficult situation because although protected since 71, the cultural heritage under protection, we know that uh, Soviet occupation period have basically closed the sea. So uh, exactly maritime and uh, uh, coastal heritage uh, uh, was basically, basically didn't, uh, didn't uh, succeed and uh, uh, sea opened again uh, for, for locals uh, uh, 93 and onwards. And basically that you talk about lighthouses and islands of uh, Lahama area that, that 140 kilometers was uh, 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 Iron Curtain area and uh, uh, islands didn't exist uh, on the maps of uh, Lahama at the time. So, uh, uh, Nowadays, uh, Lahama National Park rules uh, and management plans are done together with local communities. So basically, local communities uh, take part not only in management of the area, uh, cultural heritage, but in the government as well. And in 2015, uh, conservation uh, protection rules, uh, uh, traditional fishing traditions uh, and maritime cultural heritage is specifically uh, mentioned because it was uh, at the time under, under sp specific threat and and uh, we basically are dealing with the resurrection of that heritage, uh, not continuous tra tradition uh, in, in most parts. And uh, that is uh, the case where museums and archives are uh, the most important source uh, sometimes. And sometimes we are looking for the traditional boats from Finland or from Sweden because our, our own boats were actually sewn into halves and, uh, and, uh, and uh, put on fire uh, in the end of the 40s. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and how we do that uh, together with local communities is that uh, since 2010 we have Lahama National Park Co Cooperation Council where uh, state parties and uh, rights holders, that means landers, uh, landowners of Lahama, there are more than uh, uh, approximately 7,000 landowners and local communities and heritage communities uh, of Lahama are involved. So actually boat builders are heritage communities representatives. They don't have to live in Lahama. Uh, sometimes, uh, and traditionally they were was from Sarem or Hiumas. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, and stakeholders uh, uh, and interested parties and uh, expert organizations, that means uh, 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 museums, universities, and so on, and ICOMOS and ICOM and uh, ICROM. Uh, uh, and as about heritage communities, what are heritage communities of space, of practice, and of interest? Uh, 
Uh, here we have one diver from Soviet occupation uh, period who is uh, actually very, very good informant of uh, the Cold War heritage um, uh, uh, and uh, local communities and, uh, and of interest it is uh, ex expert, expert communities. And uh, when we are talking about, uh, of course, um, uh, when we are protecting something, then actually we need to define that something. And as about uh, uh, Lahama National Park cultural heritage connected with the sea, uh, we have special, um, uh, special uh, uh, attention to traditional fisheries and uh, maritime culture and uh, uh, both the tangible, uh, uh, movable and immovable aspects of that uh, and intangible uh, heritage connected with that, including actually language, because Pohirana language is absolutely amazing as to the, exactly the traditional fisheries and, uh, and uh, uh, coastal and sea, sea, sea cultural terms and, uh, and the nature use, that, uh, that actually means traditional fishing rights and, uh, and uh, 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 shipbuilding uh, exclusions as, as to the uh, uh, general EU uh, directive uh, uh, and regulations. Uh, and we have worked on that in uh, several uh, research uh, uh, together with uh, uh, local communities and uh, just to show some examples uh, of uh, these specific types. So as to the um, uh, coastal material heritage connected with uh, maritime and traditional fisheries, uh, we have boat landing places and you see that uh, uh, exactly this tradition is something that uh, you can go uh, from your, from your uh, village to the sea. Uh, that means that we have special regulations that allow to build uh, new boat sheds and net sheds and uh, boat landing places uh, according to the tradition. We have mapped uh, the maritime space uh, and uh, seascape and uh, landscape of uh, of the area, uh, pointing out uh, traditional uh, boat landing places and uh, and the types of them and uh, and uh, the possible uh, new developments uh, or 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 uh, of them uh, that are now in the Lahama National Park Management Plan and actually in the local county management plan, as well as uh, as it comes to uh, net and boat sheds, vergumajat. Uh, uh, exactly what is, uh, uh, how much of them uh, we have, uh, uh, mapping all of them, and uh, how and why, uh, on which terms you can build new boat sheds and uh, net sheds on the coastline uh, uh, according to the function so they don't turn into, into summer cottages. And we have quite successful story on that too. So actually you, you can keep the tradition and uh, not turn it into something else. And as well as boats, uh, that is one, one uh, amazing story actually. Uh, uh, in all the, in most of the uh, photos uh, uh, and paintings of the beginning of 20th century, you see specific piece like type boat on the north coast of Lahama, um, the north coast of Estonia uh, up to, up to Dolsa near Kunda. And uh, when we uh, had a special research uh, on where to find them, that actually only one we found in Estonia, one was in uh, Kotka Vellamo, uh, not Kotka Vellamo, but uh, Saaristo Museo. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, one is restored uh, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the type uh, and was launched in 2018. Yeah. So, and here is the boatmaster uh, building uh, that, uh, and we uh, collected information on the boatmasters of the area to historic boatmasters. And of course, uh, ship building, uh, ship uh, building places, and uh, we mapped uh, these areas too. And uh, uh, here is one of the most famous ship uh, that uh, is also, also uh, and uh, the uh, stories are Urmastresen was lately because it, it just this year turned 100 years old, and it is uh, uh, built in in Hara by Casmo uh, and Lahe, other Lahema men. So, so uh, and uh, there are approximately 50 ships. Uh, built on these areas. And uh, of course, uh, when we're talking about, about the intangible aspects, so when we talk about Lahema waters, uh, then exactly this uh, uh, Yuminda naval battle that you are 
tomorrow uh, gonna gonna see that actually the stories connected with that of the of the coastal villages are of the coastal villages of Yuminta because exactly these wrecks are around uh, there uh, in Finnish uh, Finnish Gulf and quite a lot of them. Uh, so, but the central question is, of course, traditional fishing rights and uh, how, how uh, local communities uh, can uh, help uh, to actually improve the state of the Finnish Gulf uh, while keeping their traditional fisheries. And uh, that was one of, the, one of the topics of our research too. And uh, then it uh, uh, turned that actually, uh, well, dealing with all these uh, material research, the, the most interesting uh, thing uh, for, uh, was that actually local communities start to identify themselves uh, through Pohirana cultural space because exactly these specifically, uh, uh, specific details of material and uh, immaterial heritage uh, 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 turned out to be Pohirana language space area. And what uh, surprised me uh, the most was that when we were dealing as to the management plan and regulations, I thought that we are talking all about you know building rights but what concerned the locals most was actually reviving of the language and uh, and uh, uh, stories around them and uh, uh, that you can yes uh, this is uh, just a part of uh, Lahema uh, National Park uh, this is uh, Yuminta and uh, Pärispia peninsulas and uh, as you can see this uh, only this uh, peninsula area is uh, is a part of this uh, cultural space. Uh, the cultural space itself, it's quite a new uh, concept, uh, but actually uh, uh, from, from, uh, from history also, uh, several um, uh, researches point out that uh, this area differs from, from this inlined area, because this has been Kuusalo uh, Parish uh, all times, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, for example, folklorists, ethnologists have explored this area and we have a quite huge material from, from there and they all have pointed out that there is a um, difference uh, which is we can see in the language, uh, in, in the attitude, uh, attitude uh, of people, also the, uh, a lot to visit, living, uh, uh, what they do for living, they differ. And uh, the characteristics are pointed out in here. Uh, and uh, the sea-oriented uh, lifestyle is in the center, as well this language, uh, this uh, northeast coastal dialect, uh, what we call Pohiranna. And that, that's the reason why, why this is uh, Lahema Pohiranna cultural space. And yes, uh, background is uh, some uh, researches that Lahema National Park has uh, uh, conducted uh, together in, with you yeah, uh, in recent years but also uh, uh, the, the people by themselves are starting to um, uh, look to the roots of them their their um, background or this area and this language aspect has uh, emerged also how to connect with this more with the sea uh, because the fishery isn't uh, is it so uh, big thing anymore there are other things that uh, people do for profession but still how to remain this uh, connection with the sea is a and i will just uh, shortly uh, tell about this project uh, uh, this uh, Coastal Villages Memory Spaces project, uh, which was held uh, 2015 to 2017. And uh, personally, I was responsible for the Yuminda Peninsula uh, area to, to map this historical and culturally important places, which are important to the local people, and also this living tradition, how to, uh, to collect that as well. Uh, plus uh, uh, in-depth interviews. But what was uh, a little bit different compared to other researches that had been conducted in this area, uh, that uh, the local, uh, the Lahama National Park trusted locals so much because the leading partners were Gasmo American Museum, not some central museum, uh, and you mean the Peninsula Society, which is uh, actually only local people. And uh, 
for my folklorist profession uh, or this background. Uh, the local villagers uh, did this fieldwork by themselves. I had five fantastic people with me and we did, we did a great uh, job. And what was the impact at local level? For example, this list of cultural historical places, it was, um, we listed it together. Uh, and also the scattered material is available to the local communities. It was before like that, that uh, from, from central museums or uh, somewhere, somebody came and collected something, but all the material went to this museum. It was for a local quite hard to, to reach this material. Uh, and um, this deeper interest in local history and natural environment, for example, there are some uh, kept uh, uh, and closer look, looking, for example, uh, rescue uh, station history. Also, we have uh, this language. Uh, we have a dictionary already published and, uh, and uh, even one novel in Pohirana language. And uh, I don't know, we are run of time already? Yeah, probably. One minute. Yeah. But here you can see uh, how the coast has but actually, here are these places actually were, that were mapped, uh, the, the places in the sea uh, uh, with the stories and the importance. So uh, normalized when you are studying some landscape or uh, cultural landscapes, you stick to the inland and you don't see the sea. That's why I was so amazed that, uh, because Ireland is, the most of Ireland is uh, actually sea when you, when you think of that or Norway or so. And uh, exactly in this case, uh, uh, the, the places that are known to locals are uh, besides uh, uh, place names of the inland the place names of the sea up to the Finnish coast because exactly the uh, trade routes, the, the, the um, uh, waterways uh, were the, the most important uh, part of coastal, coastal, coastal villages uh, 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 mo movings. And uh, to, just to show the depth of one place when we have this uh, one village, Hara Virvi village, then you have these all the layers of uh, uh, important places and history, starting with archaeological finds and, uh, and ending with, uh, with uh, Cold War history that has to be redefined by locals and uh, that is actually now a quite lively place uh, for all different, uh, uh, different stakeholders, st starting with uh, fishermen and uh, uh, young uh, sailing. sailing school and, and ending with the artist, uh, artists, artists uh, with graffiti, graffiti, graffiti workshops there. So and and, so, and uh, so several conferences too. Yes, and here is the last uh, slide. Uh, the old fishery uh, traditions can be uh, at the same place with the new, uh, new, mm, how to say, uh, traditions uh, uh, or the relationships with the sea. This is a uh, photos have been taken from the same day uh, from this Hara Harbor. So, um, and on the photo is a, a traditional fisherman and uh, search and rescue team leader who ha whose uh, grand grand grandfather was search and rescue team leader uh, 100 years ago. Or yes, yes, <laughs> and who happens to be her husband. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, uh, the main point of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, main success uh, and main, main motivation, um, motor of the su success is actually the cooperation and equal partnership of locals, museums, states, uh, that locals are not just informants, mm -hmm. but, uh, but equal partners uh, in, in, in all the deeds. And it, 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 it has come out with, so that actually you, you see the culture reviving and living again. And that is uh, uh, something uh, where exactly the museum collections and uh, universities have had input too. So, yeah. yes. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. I paid attention to the uh, uh, Venet ja Paatit. What's the semantic or pragmatic diff like difference between Vene and Paati? Um, 
seems that about it, it's more uh, more common in nowadays. But it has uh, the vena has been used as well. I don't know. Uh, at the moment, I, I I'm not uh, sure. I can explain the well. <laughs> and the size. I know you have small yeah, size and yeah. it's vena. Um, I, I have a question regarding uh, your techniques regarding folklore collection, which it seems. Um, did you have a, a question bank that you asked people, or did you just let them talk? And did you go back and talk to them again? Because sometimes when you go back with certain questions or certain knowledge, you find other stories coming out from, from, from their, their knowledge bank. You know, so if you interview somebody, say, for a minute or for an hour, uh, they'll come back later and they'll, they'll give you another massive story because you've stimulated it because of other cultural things that you've found. I was just wondering, did you have a, a question bank or did you just let people talk? No, actually we have this, uh, because this was more like um, memory landscapes, uh, the, the places in the landscape, the, the places... Uh, there might be stones as well as uh, the lighthouses, schools, this kind of places. Uh, but uh, they were like more like uh, keywords and then uh, kind of uh, leading questions. Right. Yes. Maybe I can just comment because actually all these inventories that we have made in Lahema uh, were pilot projects that all the, the other uh, uh, national parks were following. So actually we have very certain methodology uh, of the literary museum uh, about collecting the memory places. Uh, plus uh, we have uh, uh, several in-depth interviews with uh, local folklore bearers as addition to that. Uh, so uh, nowadays in Mohammed uh, official uh, landscape uh, map uh, database, we have a database on Lahama National Park memoriescapes as well as uh, uh, other five uh, national parks database. So it is very methodological in that sense. But, uh, but these longer interviews are separately collected, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and this, actually, I will add that the, this, um, some uh, places are already listed or there are, there are information in archives uh, from, from past as well. There have been several uh, collecting, uh, how to say, actions, yes, yes, and, and at first uh, folklorists usually ask if, if people know about those places as well or stories are something like that so but there were also new things or new new places emerge so the tradition has changed and, and secondly actually actually people when when it was a public procurement so uh, and it, it was forgotten to mention marita mari, marinescape at the time so 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 uh, in the uh, traditional fisheries inventories we had some research on that but uh, basically uh, it is uh, still in the process of uh, it's uh, harder to to map this uh, ski, sea, seascapes at the moment because we have this interruption quite a long time so we don't have this uh, this good connection the people don't have the the connections with the sea like the the the, the work when the fishing was uh, the common thing to do in the villages. Thank you. It was uh, really interesting, and uh, it's interesting because I've done work kind of like this, but not on this scale. It's much bigger. But um, a little bit follow up on the the sources and um, and, and about the folklore. Uh, when I've done something similar in the Turku archipelago, there's lots. We we have sources which were like folklore collected in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, a lot of it has to do with all kinds of uh, uh, mythological beings and places that you are not supposed to go there because if you go there with the boat to the island, uh, the boat will always be untied and it will go away because the island has a, uh, there's some a being that's strong living there. And, and or, or, so there's a lot of uh, also taboos and warnings <laughs> With regards to the seas and islands in in, 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 in our archipelago area, is this, this is this kind of a similar setting that's like rich in this type of folklore? Uh, yes, from those uh, older uh, stories that are collected, for example, from 1920s, 30s. Uh, for example, there are several stories, especially about islands, Mohni Island and Vainlo Island as well. 
where there is uh, describing how there is haunting somebody. And, uh, but I think also this is, uh, nowadays we don't have this, uh, this layer anymore because uh, connection has, the people have, have lost this connection. So we, uh, we, and we don't uh, believe <laughs> in such things anymore. Why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's, I think it's good because those are really interesting for children and other groups when you are like, like using those and, and it just, you know, stories are... Yeah, but there are inland as well as some yeah. places that are a little bit uh, scary. There are some reasons why we have to keep out from the, those places. One, one uh, peculiar tradition as to the Lahama area is fish chapels mm -hmm. tradition that we, we have traced that has been existing. And that, that is something that needs to be, uh, needs to have further research on that. And for, the whole folklore is this thing that this is only some, some small uh, pieces. Uh, there might be uh, some reasonable uh, things behind them, but, but it's uh, far away down the history. <laughs> it's quite hard to, to understand nowadays. Thank you for opening to us this culture space of Pohirana. And thank, thank you very you. much. So I'm very glad to invite Anu Brinsman to talk about how people perceive the maritime culture. And Anu is a researcher at Tallinn University in the Center of Landscape and Culture, and her main research focus is on uh, human culture or more geography, as well as landscape studies, industrial heritage, maritime culture, social practices and planning. I'm based my presentation here on two past projects. So we had interreg project together with University of Turku and Suga from Helsinki and uh, Estonian University of Life Sciences and Tallinn University. Uh, and the second project was Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Germany, Denmark and Sweden. And in, in these two projects, we more or less looked at the uh, Lahema region. So it was a little bit outside of Lahema as well. So I don't have to re repeat this uh, Lahema uh, story here. And uh, there were some personal revelations during these six years of the uh, two projects. For example, uh, I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't know that Yuminda uh, battle is regarded one of the biggest sea battles ever in Lahema. And actually, I think in uh, Mere Museum, there is currently the exhibition open about this uh, Yuminda battle. But we were dealing with uh, uh, maritime spatial planning. So, in Estonia, for example, the sea belongs to the state. In Finland, also private uh, ownership of the sea can happen. And in different European countries, it's different. So how the sea is handled. And there has been no planning of the sea until this far. So it was really a surprise because it's rather big natural resource to, to plan. And uh, yeah, we can ask that is it underused or not underused? but you can always use it uh, in sustainable ma manner to provide more working places and, uh, and yeah, national wealth as well. But yeah, we have to, uh, Baltic Sea is not in the healthiest sea, so we have to always consider how the sea health is. I was surprised how little data we have based on sea that if you look for data, there are some data sets, there are some modelings, but actually, yeah, we have depth data, but not so much more. And being uh, a geographer and cartographer as my uh, first education, so drawing lines on the map, we were also talking to the coastal seamen and asking them, where do you go? What are the best places? These things are incredibly difficult to map and also handling uh, the land and sea. So if uh, yeah, there is this question of private property and state property, we have municipalities, so who can plan what and take what action? And also um, socioeconomic and cultural values are important when we are planning something that is natural and economical, so we can't 
um, forget these. So all European Union countries uh, had to adopt maritime spatial planning. I think it was due to 2021, but due to COVID it was a little bit postponed. So Estonian first ever maritime spatial planning was adopted this May. And uh, it has been, I have been participating in some academic conferences. It seems that Estonian uh, planning has uh, did good uh, in incorporating cultural values because very many other countries didn't really do it. So the left side map is underwater uh, cultural heritage where there will be preservation areas and they, I think they are still proposals. They are not adopted or now they are adopted in the planning. So there are two dots on the northern coast and two in the south uh, west. And also uh, to see the connections uh, of the sea and land, how they interact, because the maritime spatial planning is dealing with the sea, and in the terrain we do land planning. So how the two planning um, initiatives come together is also a, an interesting question. And during this um, uh, maritime spatial planning, uh, there were very many underlying new initiatives to, uh, to map things or do some investigations and measurements. So there was also a mapping of uh, socio-cultural values and actually the uh, legend for this map is so long that it didn't uh, fit on the page. So we have some kind of dots on the map. But this is, uh, I think now I can refer back to your presentation that uh, yeah, you have the dots on the map, but what do the dots mean in this context? So, yeah, there are some keywords, but we, we, we lack the stories. And if Lahama National Park has done good, uh, then many, very many other places are not so good. And my uh, current site project is from the uh, landscape uh, research group. Uh, and I forgot to uh, put here uh, David uh, Drimbach, who is uh, from US. So we got the project together and we'd like to investigate decolonizing Estonian maritime cultural landscapes. So you briefly already heard uh, the background that during the Soviet period, uh, Estonian maritime culture, you might say, died out or it was, uh, it was killed. So here is a fragment of this border zone uh, and you need to have a special permit. If you didn't live in the area, you need a special permit to enter these areas. And uh, while it was, like Ave said, that the boats were confiscated, they were destroyed, so people didn't have boats, uh, but there were some fishermen collective farms, so it wasn't completely cut off, but still normal people didn't have access to the sea. You could go to the beach from May to September, on designated beaches, but not after sundown. So it was very limited where you could go and what you could do. And yeah, you, you need, uh, if you wanted to go to Saarema Island, you need somebody to invite you or you had to add very good reasonings why you go there. So it was a bad thing for maritime culture, but on the other hand, uh, there were no very many new buildings in this uh, border zone because, uh, so we have rather a natural coastline, which is not very, uh, uh, very commonplace in Europe anymore. And uh, almost uh, exactly a year ago, uh, a person who was nominated as a Minister of Environment wanted to reduce this no building zone from 200 meters that we have now to 20 meters. Even already old Estonians didn't build too close to the shoreline because you have wind, ice and other, the water might rise. Luckily, this kind of in initiative was uh, not adopted by the parliament this uh, January. So it was very short but in intense debate in our society how, how big this no, um, no building uh, zone should be. But we have this legacy that has cut off maritime culture, but it has also some good aspects to it as well. 
And if we look at uh, maritime culture definitions, and in, back in 2016, we had the thematic year of maritime culture in Estonia. And I think then very many people started to think, what is maritime culture? And uh, this is sort of a brief, uh, uh, brief translation of uh, what it is. But I think the major thing that I want to uh, bring out here is that it was divided for to tangible and intangible maritime culture. And then it's interesting uh, how other people have reviewed uh, maritime science. And working at university, I looked uh, web of science. And uh, there are a lot of um, publication about uh, maritime culture. Uh, I think you can't read, but the most of articles are from archaeology, so underwater cultural heritage is very well repre represented. And the uh, next is environmental sciences. So, sort of the um, majority of the papers are from archaeology. And then also in what language uh, they are, and Estonians always like to be uh, in top 10 lists then there are here three papers in Estonia on maritime culture. This is how Web of Science sees us. Of course, the majority of the uh, articles are in English. And also the popularity of maritime culture has risen quite uh, effectively. I think the graph is from 2000. So uh, this is also why we talk about maritime culture, that it's, uh, it's popular. And then in these um, projects, we also did interviews, we also did um, uh, questionnaires. So we asked, uh, is there maritime culture on the northern coast of Estonia? So we had 758 responses. Uh, 550 said, yes, there is. 50 people said no. And 150 didn't know or didn't want to answer. And then we had a follow-up uh, question in the questionnaire. Uh, what are, in your opinion, the main components of maritime culture? So, of course, the responses are in Estonian, but also in Russian, because we have the Russian population also living in the coast. And uh, I think in all Estonian folkloristics and memory studies, uh, we know that the Russians are living here, uh, but we haven't really considered their uh, experience because they were the people who colonized us. So how, how, what are their uh, memory scapes? That we, we know Estonian memory scapes, but we don't know Russian memory scapes. And uh, this spring as well, uh, we asked the question a little bit uh, in different uh, wording, name three words that come to mind. And this questionnaire was done uh, as a statistical example on our in all seven counties in Estonia that have sea coast. So um, fishing is the main thing. Um, boats, ships, harbors are important and also recreational activities because when we asked about this uh, um, maritime culture, then we yeah, think both of the water and the land. So combining these two. And a uh, very big uh, thing is uh, that people always want more ice cream and more garbage bins in the beaches. So this is sort of an ever-evolving uh, thing. And uh, what was uh, maybe a little bit uh, interesting for me is that probably this uh, border zone um, experience um, if you have to have three words describing maritime culture, so it can be history, harsh and serious. And this is for some generation of people. But for youngsters, it's free, happy sunset. And these are exact quotes from the questionnaires. So you have very opposing views, what is uh, maritime culture or how, it's, how it is. And then when we look at the word clouds, uh, the intangible heritage is underrepresented, what I think. And uh, how much time I have? Two minutes, okay. Uh, then um, 
Yeah, uh, these are on Lahema the most photographed net sheds ever in Estonia. So it's the view towards the land and uh, the view towards the sea and, and how these uh, come together. But I think uh, my main points uh, for this presentation are for me personally, how this maritime culture affects coastal landscapes, that do we have this uh, building free zone and everyone's right to roam in the, in the coastline, like we in sort of the no Northern Europe, it seems very normal that you can go to the coast, which is not everywhere. So how this intangible uh, culture affects our landscapes, because yeah, the physical objects we can map, but we can't map uh, intangible culture like that. And how this intangible maritime culture is preserved, researched, used and ex exhibited in museums, because as we heard from the last presentation, there are a lot of collections. But yeah, how to, as people, they are in museums, but people don't get or, or they don't get the feeling. So maybe in Pohiranda they, they get it, but in very many other Estonian places, people don't feel connected to the maritime culture anymore because of the Soviet period. So, thank you. What did this historical period do to traditional boat building? in Estonia and how has it revived? Uh, this is an issue that I feel not very comfortable. Uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, we, the last presentation that they have uh, this um, ship or boat buildings, but um, yeah, maybe a little help. <laughs> it has been very tough because actually uh, many boat builders uh, do exactly in 1944 escaped uh, to Sweden or uh, Finland, so actually Estonian great boat builders continue their work there. So for example, Johannes Varma in Finland, uh, absolutely great boats there. Uh, but in Estonia now, it is uh, reviving, of course, uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, Viking history, we have more Viking boats, traditional boats, than, than, uh, than uh, these old ones, uh, but uh, even uh, uh, some ships uh, have been uh, uh, reconstructed and now uh, since last year, 1st of June, uh, uh, actually Maritime Act allows uh, to build not only copies of old ships, but uh, traditional ships and boats and that gives uh, much more space to reviving traditions. So that was, uh, so it is, it is it's coming back. Uh, not in the, uh, and in the case of clinker boats, uh, we have uh, our own specific clinker boat tradition that can be connected to this uh, UNESCO intangible heritage list. Exactly, we slide the uh, type or Tartus uh, nets. Uh, lodi, lodi type. So. That's the theme of the next <laughs> presentation. So. Yes, and, and this is also interesting that we had this uh, border zone restrictions for approximately 50 years. Now 30 years or more has passed and we haven't really revived, I think, the maritime culture. And I think the number of boats and vessels that are belonging to people is also that, yeah, why should I own a boat? I live in Tallinn, so there are of course people who go sailing, but uh, I think I, I uh, retracted numbers. I think Sweden and uh, New Zealand, Finland and Norway are top boat owners per capita. And Estonia is far, far, far behind. Of course, we are a small country, but we have coastline. But sort of that you don't have to own a yacht. You can have very small boat, actually. But yeah, it's not very, very common, I think. It, it's gaining popularity, but in 30 years, it's uh, very, very slowly progressing. Yeah, uh, may I make a small comment to this shipbuilding uh, topic? Uh, I'm from Hioma, this was also the border zone in Soviet time, and uh, this uh, shipbuilding tradition uh, did survive actually uh, because, uh, of course, a lot of the shipbuilding masters uh, um, escaped in uh, 1940s from Estonia. Uh, but also the fishing cork houses uh, on the coastline, they were building uh, small boats as well during the Soviet time. And the uh, local men who were working as uh, shipbuilding workers uh, in 1930s who uh, left here, they were used for this uh, small uh, uh, 
let's say, companies uh, that were used uh, for cork hoses to build the ships. So uh, uh, when Ava mentioned earlier that most of the shipbuilders today are coming from Hiuma and Saarema, that's true because there were uh, the biggest uh, fishery cork hoses in Soviet time and this tradition survived during this uh, period. Okay, thank you. And second small remark. <laughs> A small remark on uh, actually this exactly this uh, boat or ship bo uh, boat or this tradition of uh, coming back is now exactly during the time of COVID. Uh, has uh, everyone wants to uh, buy some uh, some small yacht or or, or ship or a ship boat? Uh, so actually, uh, as to the small harbor, small ports or harbors, uh, uh, we have uh, coming to the lack of places uh, of uh, keeping the boats. So so uh, it has tremendously risen this interest during the COVID time. So yeah, and uh, I think there is also a big debate about expanding the existing harbors that there are also, th this should be planned and local communities should be involved, but there is always some kind of uh, struggle to expand the, the harbors and how, how much they should be expanded as well, I think is a question. Okay, but maybe then it's my opportunity as Anu's former colleague in geography <laughs> to ask about the method. Because I was wondering like, if you talked about that how the maritime culture is perceived did you manage actually method-wise to work out some kind of value indicators or standards or how did it go in the methods? Uh, no, because we uh, have collected the data, but sort of the data processing to articles is ongoing. Oh, right. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Anu. Yeah. The next presenter is going to be online. She's supposed to come, but unfortunately she couldn't join today here in person. And uh, as her research, is very interdisciplinary and using the arts and creative methods is the same about um, Katarina Wori, who is actually has a background in uh, sports, arts, and also she has been working as an author for the fiction and non-fiction, as well as uh, doing research in the maritime uh, heritage, especially in, when it comes to the public engagement, uh, citizen science, and combining, co combining great creativity arts and cultural heritage and she's going to talk about creative approaches to the afterlife of an anonymous 17th century lodger. I study on how to bring meaningfulness and public engagement to the afterlife to the extended biography of the wreck. Um, um, you've you had, had a, a very, very fascinating, fascinating day. So let's have a brief moment of relaxation. You can take a deep breath, roll your shoulders, close your eyes and just listen. And I will tell you when to open your eyes. Archaeological surveillance on sunny and cloudy days. The wreck was exposed, excavated with the help of an excavator. The wreck was sown for lifting on Thursday, raised in as large pieces as possible. Selected parts are conserved. The northern parts of the wreck remained in the ground. No name, no cargo, no mast, no sails, no naked, luscious, powerful figurehead, no oak was wasted on you. No oak was needed. Nobody could have built you alone. Nobody on board. No traces of your owner or your sphere of travels. You were not recycled, not burnt, not reborn as a log house. You did not perish in the deep blue. No anchor, no deck, no ropes, to hold you still. No name, no name, no compass guiding me to the right direction. And you can now open your eyes. I hope you are still awake after such a long, long day.
in 2019, I was hoping to finish up my archaeology studies and to write my master's thesis. I contacted marine archaeologist Minna Koivikko and asked, is there any maritime related heritage in the north that I could play with? A week later, she called and said that there has been a wreck discovered from downtown of Oulu. It was behind the downtown hotel under the parking lot. I remember the first time I saw the wreck. It looked huge, heavy and kind of humble. It looked as if it was asleep. I thought that any minute it could move a little bit. The second thing I sensed was the smell, a heavy, rich and smoky smell of tar and old sea. I often go back to that smell. When working in the excavation, I started to create stories in my head, imagine how things could have happened. I imagined the crew, the people who went to the forest to fall the trees, the ones who built the boat, who sailed away. I gave them children, dogs to pet. I created stories of what they ate and what they were wearing. The wreck is called the wreck of Hahtipera. There is now a hotel and bicycle lines, but they used to be the main harbor of city of Oulu. And it was called the harbor of Hahtipera. You can see it roughly on the map in the right side. It is a map from the early 17th century, circled with the blue circle is the area where, where the wreck was found and where there is nowadays a hotel. There was an international harbour exporting tar, wood, fish and importing luxury goods, salt, fabrics, coffee, the wreck is an anonymous, mute and paperless passenger from the past. Through dendrochronology, we know that she is built sometime after 1684 and that she was built of pine that grew in northern Finland. So it was local product. In that era, Finland was part of the Kingdom of, kingdom of Sweden. She's a clinker built vessel, a lodja or barge similar to the peasant yachts that ha has a long tradition of building in northern Finland and also in southern Finland. Since it is uh, nameless and paperless, it's very difficult to create a biography for the vessel. And for this reason, I wanted to focus on the extended biography, the afterlife, the life the wreck goes through, after the excavation. I am writing a, a non-fiction book about the research project and process of the wreck for public and easy reading version that explains and opens up how the research is made, archaeological and interdisciplinary. But in my, in my own research, I use a lot of creative methods. I paint a lot I create uh, speculative narratives and I also write poems. The first poem that I read you in the beginning of this presentation is a pickup or extract poem of the excavation report of the wreck of Hahtipera. It was written by Matlena Riutankoski, who was the leader of the excavation. And this is done in a way that I only I, I just picked lines from the report without touching them. 
any more than that. And um, according to studies, poetry is a great way to convey message, to give general public knowledge about science and research. And this, this kind of uh, poetry method is used quite a lot in social sciences. There is, for example, research outputs in the form of haiku, uh, traditional Japanese poetry. The second poem I, I read you, this no-no poem, is part of my poem biography of this wreck. Uh, it was inspired by a, a phrase in Jody Choi's article where he, he suggested that artifacts or objects with very hazy background can be approached by asking what they are not. And actually this, this was a familiar method for me because this is also used in human biographies and in fictional writing. So I wrote this no, no, no poem on the things that this Hahtipera is different from other wrecks. She didn't have any mast or whatsoever. It's not known if they were they were salvaged after the after the sinking or if they had been damaged before. The hotel was built in uh, 1970 to 1972, and during that time, some parts of the wreck were uh, were spoiled, and there had been rotting decay started in some of the parts. I will show you a small video of the uh, removal of the wreck. It couldn't be preserved in site in situ, so it had to, had to be removed. And this video clip will give you some idea of the dimensions and the structure of the vessel. I hope it starts there automatically. Okay, the last last bit of the wreck that came up up from the bottom was a piece that will be conservated. It's a four four rib wide piece of the wreck. 
when the wreck was discovered, there was a lot of people gathering to the area. They wanted to have a glimpse of the wreck. It's not an everyday happening that uh, an old wreck pops up in the middle of the downtown. Unfortunately, they couldn't be led to the site for safety reason. It was a construction site, very narrow. But um, when I watched at the people who, who wanted to have a glimpse at the, at the wreck, I, I thought that there might be somebody who is a great, great grandson or granddaughter of somebody who built the wreck. And it raised up the question of whose wreck is this? Is it only for archaeologists or should it be shared with everybody? Um, so a, la a quite large piece of the wreck is under conservation, but there is still more than 100 pieces that will not be conserved. And my fear is that they will end up in the storage room and never see daylight again. Um, Um, and I want people to have a chance to see them, to interact and create personal memories with these pieces. Um, I took up this dissertation research mostly because I adore this wreck and it became a very valuable part of my own personal biography. So I want to give the public a chance to see and sense the past in their own way, not dictated by museum creators. And I am also interested in the emotions of the public. Uh, in my opinion, people should have the possibility to experience the cultural her heritage in different ways. As it's stated in the UNESCO's FARO Convention, everyone has the right to benefit from the cultural heritage and to contribute towards its enrichment. I believe that by engaging the public, we can also affect the ways that people value cultural heritage and heritage work. And my plan is to organize workshops uh, where there are authentic pieces of this work and people can write structured poetry exercises, uh, maybe creative writing or drawing. And I would like to organize document, documentation workshops for children, give them cameras and see what they focus on, what they find interesting and worth capturing with a camera. Um, maybe I could also deliver information, research information about the REC through a meditation session. Um, and I want to involve the general public to the discussion of what should and could be done with these pieces are not that are not conserved and won't be displayed in museum. Maybe the public arts happening or something similar. And in my research, I will use a semi-structured questionnaire to find out what people think about this kind of workshop activities. And I also want to scope the Finnish museums with a questionnaire to find out what their opinion is in this kind of creative approaches to cultural heritage, non-intrusive creative ways. But that's it. I want you guys to get something to eat tonight. So that was my presentation. I'm very happy I could participate this way. It's been a fascinating seminar. And Thanks. if you are interested in the structural facts about this wreck or the post-excavation processes, Minna Koivikko is very much involved in scanning and documenting and interpreting this, this vessel um, in Many, many ways you can ask her. She is there and available for any questions you have. Thank you. Just uh, also raise a big thank you to all the speakers. I have had a fabulous day, a lot of inspiration, which I was hoping for, a lot of different angles in uh, uh, attacking these themes, uh, communication, how do we work with the maritime cultural heritage, how do we uh, 
work with it together with others outside our own profession. So I have uh, got a lot of food for thought and I'm quite tired now because it's been an intense day. So I think I'll leave it to you and uh, for the practical things. Yeah. Thank you. See you tomorrow also. Thank you, Anna. And from my side, I want to thank everyone, all the presenters, all the participants in online, all the audience here for this very fruitful discussion about these different angles of the preserving and popularization of the maritime ar uh, archaeological heritage. And, uh, and just a um, little bit to take, take the chance to, to give out a bit like a teaser or <laughs> information. The Estonian Maritime Museum is actually preparing the new uh, permanent exhibition in the topic of maritime archaeology, including the underwater archaeology. So in a couple of years, you're all welcome back and to see this this new exhibition and, and we hope that t today's discussion actually greatly con contributed to this um, actually to this concept what we are working out at the moment in the museum. I would like to maybe together with Anna to thank um, to thank first of all our uh, how is it? <laughs> uh, like um, it was like a bridge in bit between different uh, pieces. Uh, Isabella Glushaskaite, because Isas Isabella has been holding all the communication about the conference <laughs> together. So thank you, Isabella, and I think she really deserves a big applause for this. <laughs> and, and of course, I want to also thank our maritime archaeology like group members, uh, Ivar, Preet, Lisette, and, and of course, uh, Museum uh, and Marketing Department, uh, Iris, Marge, Lee. Of course, museum artist Roman. Then I would also like to thank, um, um, let me think, communication officer <laughs> Katja, as well as uh, our catering uh, and catering company Maro, and and of course uh, our IT helpers uh, Tonis and uh, and Walter, and of course uh, here in the Keller Theater, I would thank you would like to thank Keller Theater and um, Rene, who has actually been sitting there and trying to keep us all together, both online and, and here, and Janne for being here. And as well as I say least, but uh, maybe the most, I would like to thank our museum director, Urmas Stresen, who actually sends very kind regards to all of you. Unfortunately, he couldn't participate today because of the um, uh, sickness or sudden, sudden like health issues. And, uh, but he actually really yeah, sends all regards. And of course, all the board members of the museum, uh, I would like to thank, and um, I hope that I don't forget <laughs> anyone. If you, and maybe you want to add some people more from your organization. Uh, I, I, I first like to thank you all and for organizing this, and as I said, for inviting us, and also uh, all the people uh, from our own organization who has been involved in different things, and not least uh, Odd Johansson, who is the director of, of Rock, who couldn't be here as well, but has been involved in the planning. Uh, I think I uh, leave it at that and... Uh, yeah. Thank you and see you next year because then the topic will be environmentally dangerous effects. <laughs> Thank you.